old times January 2013 sixth anniversary. I couldn't tear myself away from her in the car. We sat in the restaurant parking lot, kissing like high school kids on a date. My hands explored her body, and I inhaled her sweet scent. One of her hands was on the back of my head, pulling me towards her, and the other was desperately trying to unbutton my pants. Why is your belt so damn tight? She moaned impatiently. After sharing her disappointment, I paused and unfastened the buckle. As soon as her hand was free, she immediately reached for what she longed for. Oh my God, you're so tough, she exhaled. I could only moan in response. Okay, Josh, stop it. Take me home and please have sex. I had other, more depraved ideas. My hand went under her dress until I found her panties. Carefully, I grabbed them and began to pull them down. Josh, what are you doing? The scene was intense, and I slowly pulled her panties down, feeling her body tense with anticipation. She tilted her head back slightly, spreading her legs as far as the circumstances allowed. My fingers gently touched her skin, and I began to caress her slowly, trying to take my time, feeling the growing tension fill the space. Continue. Her voice was muffled, but full of passion. I continued to caress her, feeling how her body responded to my movements. Everything at that moment seemed important her breathing, her barely audible moans, her complete trust in me. I touched her again, and her reaction was lightning fast her hips rose, and she pulled me forcefully towards her, completely immersed in her sensations. I. She exhaled, and her body seemed weightless. Her desire filled the entire car, but at that moment all that mattered was her feeling of comfort and closeness. I carefully watched her reaction, trying not to lose a second of this unforgettable moment that was only ours. When it was over, she snuggled up to me, still breathing slightly unsteadily, but now completely calm. When I was finally able to return to the real world, I saw Naomi giggling. I noticed that she was not looking at me, but past me. My heart almost stopped when she waved to someone over my shoulder. What the... I thought and turned my head sharply. Through the foggy windshield, I saw an elderly couple looking at us with slack jaws. I turned back to Naomi, and we laughed. Do you think they saw everything? I whispered. She giggled again and replied. Yes, of course. Later that night, we lay in bed, cuddled together. Henry spent time with his beloved aunt, so the evening was just ours. What did you do with him? I asked casually. Naomi looked up at me. Who is this with? I was irritated that she pretended not to understand what I was talking about, but when I looked at her, I realized that she sincerely did not understand. With Antonio. At the restaurant. When you walked back together, what did you do? A smile appeared on her face. Josh, are you jealous? She asked playfully as her hand slowly slid down my stomach. No, just curious, I muttered, trying to keep my voice calm. But let's be honest. I lied like a coward. I was madly jealous, but it wasn't just out of jealousy. There was something else that I couldn't quite put my finger on. This jealousy excited me. No, I didn't want Naomi to sleep with that guy. Not for real. At least that's what I thought. But those fifteen minutes, when I didn't know what she was doing or how long she would be gone, were incredibly exciting. It was the most intense erotic sensation I had experienced in a long time. I think it's what they call cuck anxiety. Intellectually, I could not understand this feeling or decide whether it was good or bad. But for some reason it turned me on. Paradoxical. Just curious, right? She said, feeling that my little friend was ready to play again. Tell me, I said with more passion than I intended. It sounded like an order mixed with lust. Yes, I was excited. Why hide? I was only wearing boxers, so she was able to free me easily. She slid down until she was eye level with my groin. She knew how it affected me. Slowly her hands began to move. Well, if you really must know, it was almost innocent. Almost? He gave me a tour of the kitchen, and I met the chef who prepared our dish. While I was thanking the boss, I felt Antonio. Her voice trailed off as she studied my reaction. I was no longer here. What is he? I felt him start stroking my lower back, and then, my butt. What the hell? I literally screamed. 
but there was not a drop of anger in my voice. The anger disappeared. The only thing I felt was lust. Yes, she said with a little more confidence. He started rubbing my butt. I think he thought I wasn't wearing panties because he couldn't feel them. All he touched was my buttocks. Oh my God, I shouted. She went into the bathroom to wash up while I lay there, completely drained. She came back with a wet rag and dried me off. Did you let him touch you? I asked with less passion. Now I started thinking like a jealous husband again and not like a horny teenager. We all know that after pleasure, lust dissipates and you begin to see things differently. Without a doubt, you are moving from excitement to reality. I didn't let him touch me, but I didn't stop him either. I just walked away. She answered honestly. But he managed to touch enough to think you weren't wearing panties. Yes. I thought about it. I could see that she was trying to understand what I was thinking. Hell, I didn't even really know what I was feeling. I should have been meaner, shouldn't I? I was a little jealous, of course, but I wasn't angry. Well, it worked, I finally said. She sighed with relief. I really wanted that dollar. Present September 2015. Naomi, do you love him? Nothing else matters. This is a question that has been tormenting me for the past week. Sitting in Trina's basement, lost in my despair, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Oh my God, Josh, no, I don't love him. I don't like him at all. I stared at the ceiling in disgust. If she now starts with that cliché, it's just sex, that I've read so often in stories like this, there's a chance I'll end up in jail for beating my wife beating. I don't love him. I, I don't even really like him as a person. Naomi's words struck me like thunder. So you want me to believe that you've been secretly meeting him and having sex for weeks and you don't like him? It's true, Josh, believe it or not. I rubbed my fingers over my temples, trying to ease the headache that was about to start. Naomi sat on the bed opposite and looked at me. Naomi, are you still seeing him? Were you with him after you told me? I asked, afraid to hear the answer. No. Of course not, Josh. I'm so ashamed and afraid. No, I wasn't with him anymore, I promise. You must believe me, she answered immediately and decisively. Naomi isn't lying. If she says something, it's true. She didn't lie even once. But there is always a first time. I'm not naive. Well, not really. Then why? Why did you risk so much for a guy you don't like? Are his underpants big? Did you often have fun? Why was he so special? I don't know, Josh. I don't know. He didn't have a huge. And you know that's not the only thing that's important to me. For some reason, I couldn't stop seeing him. There was something there that I couldn't put my finger on. It was just... I don't know what it was. Did he force you to have fun? She nodded sadly and suddenly couldn't look me in the eyes. Was this many times? I asked softly not really wanting to know the answer. But I already knew what the answer would be. She nodded affirmatively again. We sat in relative silence. Well, I was silent. Naomi sobbed loudly and quietly. Mom, why are you crying? An innocent voice came from the corridor, breaking through our bubble of despair. We both turned our heads sharply and saw our son, rubbing his eyes, standing in the doorway. I had completely forgotten that Henry was sitting in the living room watching TV. Henry is such a good kid that sometimes you just forget he's there. He doesn't throw tantrums and doesn't demand attention. All you have to do is give him something to do, and he will entertain himself. Forgetting about her own pain, Naomi immediately switched to caring mother mode. Mommy is fine, honey. Just a little tired, that's all. It's already late. It's time for you to go to bed. His eyes began to fill with tears. I don't want to sleep, Mommy. I, I'm scared. Which again? Henry pouted and nodded, his head bobbing up and down like little children do. That exaggerated nod was both sweet and heartbreaking. Henry had been tormented by nightmares about the witch for some time. One day, Trina's children were watching Insidious when Henry was visiting them. They didn't notice he was sitting in the room until he had watched about ten minutes of the movie. This was enough to give him nightmares for the next two weeks. Do you want mom to lie down with you for a while? 
Henry nodded again in that exaggerated motion. Naomi looked at me, as if asking permission to pause our conversation. Silently, we exchanged glances, and she left with her son. This brief respite from the difficult conversation gave me the opportunity to think a little about what had happened. The basic facts were this. My wife had been secretly seeing and sleeping with another man for several weeks, despite the fact that we were able to discuss her sexual desires openly. And that's what confused me. If she had fallen in love with him, or he was something special to her, it would have been understandable. It would be incredibly painful, but at least I would have a logical explanation. But according to her, this is not so. She didn't even like the guy. But for some reason, he gave her pleasure. Something about their relationship cost her those risks. Something is missing here. Either she is lying to me for the first time in our marriage, or there is some part of her that this man is satisfied with, but I could not. I don't like either option. Both carry serious consequences for our future together. About half an hour later, Naomi returned from putting our son down. She looked much calmer. Her eyes were still puffy, but she looked ready for the second part of our conversation. What are you thinking about, Josh? Are you going to leave me and Henry? Until this moment, I myself was not sure what I wanted. The part of me that wanted to bolster my male ego told me to kick this woman out as painfully as possible. However, my heart did not allow this. Deep down, I knew that a few months of pride would not be worth a lifetime of loneliness and regret. Especially after she correctly answered the two most important questions, does she love him and is this over? These answers gave us a chance to fix something. They say that the scariest words for an old man are, what if? I don't want to look back at my life one day and make these words the motto of my existence. What if I gave up too early? What if I stayed and fought? What if I tried to understand why she did this before deciding to leave? What if we could find a way to move forward together? No, Naomi, I'm not going to leave, but we have a serious problem that needs to be solved. I saw relief literally wash away the tension from her body. She immediately closed the distance between us, rushing towards me and hugging me around the waist, burying her face in my chest. I let her press herself against me, but I didn't put any effort into returning the gesture. This could give her the wrong signal that all is forgiven, and that hasn't been the case at least not yet. I pulled her away to look her in the face. I needed her to understand where I was coming from when I said that. I need to understand what happened, Naomi. I don't know what went wrong and I need to find out. I'm a technician. One thing I know for sure is that you cannot treat symptoms. You need to find the problem itself. This is the only way to prevent it from happening again. I know, Josh. While you were with Trina, this was all I could think about. That's why I made an appointment with a family psychologist. I want to talk about everything that's going on in my head. There are too many confusing thoughts that I cannot sort out. What thoughts are we talking about, Naomi? I noticed how her face became thoughtful. She couldn't look me in the eyes anymore. Lately I've been feeling, I don't know, restless. Maybe alarming. I feel like there's something wrong with me, but I can't figure it out. Are you unhappy with me, or Henry? No, Josh. Not by you. I love you both. I have a wonderful husband who understands me better than I could have ever dreamed, and a sweet son who lights up my life. You are my heart. The dissatisfaction concerns only me. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I feel like I'm missing something. But I can't understand why. Does this have something to do with our game? She thought for a minute. I don't think the game was the reason. But the further we got into it, the more I began to feel things that I once felt when I was younger. Those feelings that I buried when we decided to build our life together. It suddenly dawned on me that there were parts of Naomi that I knew nothing about. Even though I am so close to her, there are places in her soul that I have never entered. She carefully guards these places, and I had no idea that they were there. However, no one can hide their identity forever. When is your first appointment? On Thursday. I nodded. Well, I guess I'll have to tell Tom that I'll be gone for part of the day. Past December 2013. Everything was calm for about a year. 
Naomi started taking more shifts at the gym because Jerry left. His day job began to require more time, and he could not combine it with work at the gym. He still came regularly to train, but was no longer on the payroll. When Jerry left, Naomi quickly became popular, and I don't just mean her looks. She took charge and filled the void left by Jerry. She truly helped people achieve their fitness goals. Both employees and clients were confident that hiring her was the best decision they could have made. I was very proud of her. This was also the time I received my promotion. Tom, my boss, began to need help. The workload began to increase, and the company had to hire five more technicians. Tom felt that with the arrival of new employees and an increase in the volume of work, we needed to divide our department into teams. When this proposal was approved, Tom offered to appoint me as the leader of one of the teams. I was hardworking, competent, and had been with the company longer than most. The new structure took several months to fully establish, but very soon began to produce results. Clients were happy because we responded to their requests faster. Our department became more organized and efficient, and we even had to work fewer hours overall. Our department became a model that others tried to emulate. As I said, Tom and I worked well together. As for my sex life with Naomi, it was absolutely amazing. Her self-confidence skyrocketed, and this was reflected in her behavior towards me. She often initiated sex herself and was more relaxed and passionate. I even had to cover her mouth with her own panties so she wouldn't wake up Henry. I'll tell you honestly, there is no greater excitement than having sex with my wife with her panties in my mouth. The game we started playing seemed to give our sexual experience a turbo boost. We explored the full power of Naomi's sexuality. It's good that we only played for dollars. If I had bet ten instead of one dollar on the first bet, I would probably have had to take a second job to pay off my debts. I began to notice how stupid men could be, seriously. As soon as you opened your cleavage or showed a little leg, men literally turned into plasticine in her hands. I say, in our hands, because everything they did for Naomi benefited me. For example, she once saved me from a speeding ticket, and a big one. I was driving 90 miles per hour on a 65 miles per hour limit, and the cop pulled me over like he'd been waiting all day for this. Naomi asked me for my wallet. Confused, I gave it to her. She then slowly took out a dollar from it and stuffed it into her bra. I smiled when she said, Don't worry, dear. I'll sort it out. With these words, she got out of the car and headed towards the police car. And she settled it. By the time we left, the fine had been replaced with a stern warning. In exchange, I pretended not to notice the policeman giving her his phone number. The stakes in the game have become bolder. This turned her on. Let me give you an example. One day, Naomi and I had a free Saturday because Jerry and my sister Trina took the kids to an amusement park. They were kind enough to take Henry with them. Although Henry was too young for most of the rides, Trina knew Naomi and I needed a day to ourselves. She asked Jerry to take him with her. We decided to spend the day together, have lunch and take a walk in the park. When we pulled up, I put a dollar on the dashboard and told her what she had to do to win it. To begin with, she had to take off her panties and bra right in the car and give them to me. It was too easy inside the car. However, I had never won before and decided to go all in. She was wearing a fairly short button-up dress, so the next thing was that she had to unbutton one more button than usual to allow her bra to show. Of course, without a bra, all it took was one careless movement and, oh my God, an elegant embarrassment. Moreover, her dress was very thin. If she stood in front of a light source, everyone could see her legs all the way to the top. And if you look closely, you might notice that she is without underwear. The final condition was that she was not to adjust her dress even once during the day. She decided that she would just move carefully and watch where she was in order to avoid incidents. But as I expected, there was a small problem. There was a slight breeze, so weak that under normal circumstances you wouldn't even notice it. But for her, it was a real test. Every time the wind picked up, she tensed. I was turned on too. It's a good thing my trousers weren't too tight, otherwise I would have had to hold a book in front of me all day. 
she was very careful in her movements so that nothing was accidentally exposed. However, I plan to change this. I will either win this bet or someone will see its beauty. Either way, it will be a victory for me. I laid out the blanket and invited her to sit down. Usually, she would have adjusted the dress to fit herself and everything would have been fine, but she couldn't do that. She looked at me with wide eyes that clearly said, You are a scoundrel. I will say this. Between the wind, the sitting position, and the fact that I allegedly, accidentally, lifted her dress, several guys and older couples were able to see more than they expected. If there were children there, I would, of course, preserve her modesty. But if they weren't there, against all odds, she won the bet. But so do I. I was so excited by what I saw that I didn't last long when I finally took possession of her. This game had an amazing impact on our relationship. We started spending more time together. We began to find time for each other. Before this, it seemed to us that we did not have enough time for solitude. But now we couldn't get enough of each other. We enjoyed it. Everything was fine. She started calling me at work just to say hi. She sent messages saying how much she missed me. One day she even came up behind me, put her arm around my waist, and told me how much she loved me and that she would be lost without me. For her, who avoided saying the word love, this was significant. The best moment I remember is when she unexpectedly came to my work. My team and I were busy taking inventory and there was still a lot of work to be done. I told Naomi that I would be late until late because our data didn't match and we needed to go through all the journals, inventory, and accounts for the entire month to find any errors. She was upset when I told her this. She asked if I had eaten anything, to which I replied that I would try to eat if I had time. About 45 minutes later she called again. I answered the call a little annoyed, because there was a lot of work, but the irritation quickly passed when she said that she was standing in the parking lot and needed help bringing in the food she had brought. I went out to meet her and saw that she had brought four large pizzas and drinks. Josh, you need to eat. No matter how much work you have, take a break. I wanted to object, but I saw her make an offended face. And then, I miss you. You'll be home late, so at least spend an hour with me. This break lifted the spirits of my entire team. For an hour Naomi sat with us, chatting happily and keeping the conversation going. And all this time she sat on my lap. She flirted, but not too intrusively. Her charm made all my guys look at her with admiration. She talked to the guys, telling them what a wonderful husband I was. Since then, my colleagues have looked at me with envy. I even heard two of them whispering about how lucky... I was to come home to such a woman every night, and I completely agreed with them. She also convinced me to go to the gym. She said that this way I could see for myself how men courted her, instead of then listening to her stories. I suspected that her real goal was to get me to exercise. She saw my belly starting to grow and used my lust to convince me to do something good for my health. They say men are stupid, and I am no exception to this rule. We decided that as part of our game, we wouldn't tell people at the gym that I was her husband. It would be a strange coincidence that we have the same last name. I was just another client who needed training and assistance from an instructor. On the days when I was at the gym, she included a full flirting program. I caught her eye when she allowed someone to touch her muscles so that they could feel the tension. Or when she needed to help a guy get into the right position and she touched his body and then she told me to do everything with her that these guys could only dream of. Life stabilized in this amazing new rhythm for about a year, and then one night changed the nature of our game, and our relationship was on the line between love and lust. It all started innocently enough. Naomi had a friend named Jasmine who was getting married. Naomi was one of the bridesmaids. The wedding was supposed to take place in a special place for the couple, three hours away from our city. It was quite easy to organize, so there were no difficulties. The wedding was scheduled for Sunday, but the bachelorette party was on Friday, and Naomi wanted to go for a few days. My partner Tom was facing family difficulties and had to take a few days off work at the last minute, so I had to take over his responsibilities. I had a lot of work to do on Friday, 
and since I didn't know the groom and his friends, my presence at the bachelor party, which also took place on Friday, would not be noticeable. Naomi and I discussed this and decided that she would go first and spend time with her friends, and I would join her later when I had finished my business. She left, kissing me tenderly and asking me not to keep her waiting long. When I told her to behave, she laughed and said, I will try, but there will probably be a slender dancer who will rub against me. You better come soon, otherwise I don't know what I can do if you're late. As you know, if something can go wrong, it will definitely go wrong. One of Tom's team members made a rather serious mistake that needed to be corrected urgently. I didn't want to bother Tom, so I went to the client myself. I knew this man well from my days as a field technician, so I was able to settle the matter. Together with the new employee, we made the necessary changes and figured out his mistake. Unfortunately, by the time I returned to the office, I was left with two options. Either stay late into the night and finish all the paperwork, or get up early on Saturday morning and work until noon. I chose the second option. When I finally got home, I tried calling Naomi, but she didn't answer. I left a voicemail explaining the situation. A little later, I realized that she most likely would not listen to him, so I sent her a message asking her to call back, since we had a change in plans. About 20 minutes later, Naomi called me, and it was clear that she had been drinking and quite a lot. I heard how much fun she was having. She wasn't too drunk, but she spoke louder than usual and said things she wouldn't say sober. And then everything changed dramatically. Josh, I want you so much. I need you here. I'm so excited looking at all these hot guys. I urgently need sex. Hot guys. I felt a strange feeling begin to arise inside. Yes, it was jealousy, but with it came something else excitement. I tried to come up with a game bet to turn Naomi on and have her ready for sex when I arrived, but in her drunken state she had already taken the next step. All these guys are right in front of my face. And they are so delicious, she said. The world seemed to stop. Well, except for my heart, which at that moment could compete in speed with a racing car. Are they tasty? What do you mean? I squeezed out with difficulty. You know what I mean, darling, she replied seductively. I was shocked. Chaos was happening in my head, jealousy, anger, excitement, and lust mixed into a storm of feelings, and I could not understand what I felt more strongly. The words got stuck in my throat. Did you give them pleasure? I was finally able to ask. She laughed and said, We all did it, love. At that moment, I no longer knew what to feel. Yes, I was angry, but not as angry as I should have been. It was strange. I was angry at the situation, at Tom taking time off at this point, at the fact that I couldn't be there for her. But what angered me most was that my wife was in such a state that if I were nearby, I could simply drown in her passion. She continued, There's one guy here, everyone calls him the Italian Stallion. He's so damn sexy, and he has a big one. But he keeps moving from one to the other before anyone has time to set the right rhythm. I think he just wants to last longer. And then I made a decision that completely changed the rules of our game, making it much more dangerous. I bet you a dollar that you can't please him, I said. Present September 2015. Thursday has finally arrived. Today is our first session with a family psychologist. Naomi and I are sitting on a leather sofa in a surprisingly cozy office. I notice soft music in the background. There are many plants around us that give the room a pleasant look. There are paintings hanging on the walls that harmonize with the decor and furniture. It's clear that someone tried to make this place as comfortable as possible. I don't want to be sexist, but as soon as I entered the office, I was convinced that our psychologist was a woman. No man would pay so much attention to office design. Men's rooms usually display our accomplishments as if we were bragging about our lives. This office was clearly designed with comfort and relaxation in mind. It was pleasing to the eye and created a feeling of peace. Naomi and I were naturally nervous. We temporarily suspended our difficult conversation about her betrayal, deciding to discuss it in the presence of a specialist. We weren't getting anywhere in our conversations, so we made a temporary truce and waited. We had been polite to each other all week, 
but the atmosphere between us remained cold, without the slightest sign of warmth or affection. I hear voices outside the door, two female voices. A slender woman opens the door and smiles warmly, looking us up and down. My guesses turned out to be correct, and I mentally praised myself for my insight. I have always loved detective series, especially elementary, and I managed to guess the gender of the psychologist before meeting him. Naomi and I watch as Dr. Carter comes into the office and stands in front of us. Well, hello, Naomi and Joshua. She greets us as if she had been waiting to meet us all day. She extends her hand to me first, I shake it, then repeats the gesture with Naomi. My name is Dr. Carter, but I'd like you to call me Beth, she says, and we both nod. Beth sits down across from us and places three notebooks on her lap. Beth looks like she's in her early fifties. She is small and quite attractive for her age, something like an older version of the heroine of the TV series Ally McBeal. Her sincere smile seems to be a permanent part of her face and her voice is soft but confident. She is the perfect combination of professionalism and friendliness. Before we start discussing what brought us here, let me tell you a little about myself, she began. My name is Dr. Bethany Carter, and I have been in counseling for 22 years. For the last 12 years, I have been working as a family psychologist. During this time, I have seen and heard a lot, so I can honestly tell you that nothing you say will shock me. She paused, as if waiting for some reaction or confirmation from us. We both nodded again to show we understood. Personally, I have been married for 28 years to the same wonderful, but sometimes annoying man. He is my first and only husband. I made him swear that if I died early, he would follow me to the grave. I've spent so many years smoothing out all the rough edges, and I won't let another woman reap the benefits of my work. This made us both laugh. Her friendliness made me feel more relaxed, and I felt that Naomi had calmed down a little too. Now let me tell you what my role is and set a few rules. First of all, I'm not here to fix your marriage. I can't do this. Anyone who claims they can is either lying or deluded in their abilities. The only people who can make or break your marriage are the two of you. My role is to create a space where we can communicate openly and honestly. Together we will embark on this journey and see where it takes us. Sounds good. We nodded again. The fact that Beth said she couldn't fix our marriage confused me. I didn't expect this. I always believed that counselors had all the answers and could help us build relationships. But to be honest, her words calmed me down. I expected Beth and Naomi to spend the entire session urging me to forgive everything and move on. But now, hearing this, I felt like that pressure had been taken off me. I didn't have to immediately fix the situation. We could just talk. Fine. Rule number one, we listen to each other. This means that only one of us speaks, the others do not interrupt. If you have a question, you will write it down on the notepad I give you and ask it when I allow it. Second rule, we only use words that will help us on this journey. This means no insults, foul language, or humiliation of each other. We are all smart enough to express our feelings in words without resorting to childish behavior. Agreed. We could only nod again in agreement. Great. Let's begin. Here are your notepads and pens on the table in front of you. Now, Josh, I'd like to start by hearing your perspective on how we got here today. Past December 2013. I couldn't concentrate on the boring paperwork that needed to be done, all night I had dreams about Naomi pleasuring some muscled dancer. I tried to send her several messages, but she didn't respond. This only added fuel to the fire of my imagination. Did she really do it? Maybe they secretly retired and had sex. Why doesn't she answer my messages? Is this a good sign or a bad sign? I finally realized that I wouldn't be able to sleep and got up to get to work. The sooner I start, the sooner I finish, and the sooner I can get answers to my questions. By 10 am I was already on my way. I covered three hours of travel in two hours and 32 minutes. Jeff Gordon would be proud of me. When I arrived at the hotel and received my room key from the front desk, I became concerned when I didn't find Naomi in our room. I frantically took out my phone and sent her a message. I've arrived. 
Where are you? The five minutes that I waited for her answer seemed like an eternity. Finally, the phone rang. We're chatting with Jasmine. I'll be there soon. I didn't know what to expect when she arrived. I was shaking. When she opened the door and our eyes met, I examined her carefully. She still looked like my Naomi. She didn't look like she'd spent the night in the dancer's arms. Hey, honey, she said, pulling me by the collar of my shirt for a kiss. I missed you last night. Really, Naomi? I asked, sounding a little more accusatory than I intended. She tensed and looked at me slightly puzzled. I smiled to reassure her, and she relaxed. She reached into her purse and pulled out a dollar. I lost, she said with feigned sadness. Is it true? Well, I'll be happy to take it, I said with a smile, humming the tune of We're in the Money. We both laughed and hugged each other. And what happened? You couldn't do it, I asked, feeling both disappointed and relieved. But her answer amazed me. Oh no, I did it, she grinned. I felt something break inside me. I tried to remain calm as I chose my words. Did you do this? Yes, she answered, carefully watching my reaction. So you gave him pleasure? My voice trembled, but I tried to hide my emotions. She looked me straight in the eye, studying my expression. I tried not to show my feelings, but a hurricane was raging inside me. I was torn between excitement, anger, and jealousy, and all these feelings were mixed into some incomprehensible mixture. Yes, I delivered, she answered, without looking away. But you couldn't bring it to its peak? I tried to hold on, but I realized that my emotions were boiling. A sly smile appeared on her face, as if she knew something juicy that she was ready to tell. Did any of you do it? I asked, feeling that she was stalling. She nodded, biting her lips slightly, as if she couldn't wait to share a secret. Bride, she whispered, as if she was afraid that someone would hear. I almost jumped on the spot. Jasmine, she's getting married tomorrow, I exclaimed in complete bewilderment. Naomi laughed, trying to calm me down. She took him to her room, Naomi replied, her eyes widening at what was said. Are you saying that she slept with him? I couldn't believe it. Naomi nodded, and images immediately appeared in my head. My imagination began to depict scenes of the bride, who was to be married the next day, in bed with an Italian dancer. I was both shocked and excited. And what did she say? I asked, almost afraid to hear the answer. Naomi giggled and leaned closer to me. She said it was the best sex of her life. Now, I'm sure your head is just boiling. Imagine a woman who is getting married the next day getting pleasure from a huge dancer. It's hard not to judge her, isn't it? After all, she didn't say anything to the groom. Judge me if you want, but for me this story was incredibly exciting. I couldn't explain it even to myself, but the pictures in my head how her friend, who would become his wife tomorrow, was lying under this guy, moaning with pleasure drove me crazy. After this internal movie played in my imagination, I myself was ready for action. But we had to hurry, as Naomi had to be in time for the wedding rehearsal. So I reluctantly went with her to the shower, where we helped each other wash and quickly got dressed. I sat in the hall, watching the women discuss all the details of the upcoming ceremony with the pastor and wedding coordinator. But I couldn't stop looking at Jasmine. She acted as if nothing had happened. She smiled all the time, her face shone with happiness and anticipation of tomorrow. But I couldn't look at her without imagining her giving pleasure, not to her fiancé. My mind was frantically trying to imagine her moans, her flexibility, her hands that were probably squeezing the sheets while they had her, and all this with a diamond ring on her finger. Looking at her, I couldn't help but think about my wife. What if it was Naomi? How would I feel if she were Jasmine? Would I feel the same excitement? Would I become her husband after this? The next day, the wedding and reception went flawlessly. The guests ate, danced, and drank. Everyone enjoyed it. After the celebration, the happy newlyweds left in a limousine to start their new life together, after which they went to Jamaica for two weeks. I waved after them, slightly unsteady from drinking, as Naomi and I went to our room. We had amazing sex before we fell asleep. The next morning I woke up before Naomi, who was still lying naked next to me. 
As I lay listening to the birds chirping outside the window, I began to think about Jasmine. She must have already woken up with her new husband after a night of wedding sex. They're probably doing the same thing Naomi and I were doing last night. But I couldn't stop thinking about what she was doing 48 hours before with another man. If Naomi did the same thing and I found out about it, would I become her husband? The answer was ambiguous. When we were just getting married, if she had done something like that, we wouldn't be together now. One thing is to do it while being free, unencumbered by obligations. But to do this while accepting my ring would be unacceptable. Then, but now, now, after everything we've been through together, the situation has changed. At some point in the course of our relationship, my perception changed. I wasn't turned on by the thought of another man having sex with my wife. It didn't turn me on. But the fact that other men were attracted to Naomi, that they wanted her, wanted to possess her, that turned me on. Yes, she was mine, and I was sure of it. It was this confidence that allowed me not to perceive her possible actions as a betrayal. I don't know, maybe our game changes my idea of love and lust. The key to everything is honesty. The game showed me that we can explore sexuality outside of traditional marriage, but this can only be done by being completely honest with each other. I trusted her, and it was this trust that made our game work. The lesson I later learned was that this was critical to what we were doing. I realized how much my thinking had changed when I thought about my reaction to Naomi's comment that, they're delicious. Yes, I was a little angry, but I was more angry that I wasn't there to take her. I should have been furious, but I wasn't. Even now, remembering this, I cannot find the anger necessary for such a situation. A little jealousy because she called him a big boy, sure but it wasn't the kind of all-consuming jealousy that makes husbands go crazy. All I felt was the desire to have sex with my wife. Curious. When we returned from the wedding, I stopped thinking about Jasmine. Life continued as before. My wife and I had sex almost every day. She flirted without a twinge of conscience. It excited us. The game took a new turn. My wife started flirting openly with people we knew, especially when I was around. I pretended not to notice anything. She pretended to be drunk and allowed herself to lose control. She danced provocatively and allowed the guys to touch her furtively. Our gazes met when no one was looking at us, and in these moments a spark of desire ran between us. When I knew guys were seeing me, I played the part of the fool, laughing and interacting with others as if I had no idea what was going on. This spurred their courage. We've done this at a few parties with our friends. You would think that people would start looking at us askance, but this did not happen. Since she was drunk, everyone attributed her behavior to intoxication, believing that it was the guys who took advantage of her vulnerability. When we saw them again, she let them relax, insisting that she didn't remember anything. She said, I hope I didn't do anything too embarrassing yesterday, to which they always responded that she behaved perfectly. And I, as someone who understood nothing, could proudly say, You were fine, dear. I didn't notice anything strange. Of course, I saw a slight grin on the faces of these bastards. Later that night, after she had been given a good cuddle, she told me everything in great detail. We discussed the lengths to which the guys went. Some were content to grope her buttocks and breasts. Others went further and took advantage of her vulnerable state. They did things like put their hands up her skirt or under her blouse. One of my neighbors almost pushed her panties aside before she pushed him away. Discussing these cases always ended with us exhausting each other into unconsciousness in bed. Life with Naomi couldn't be better. Plus, my son made all my long work days worth it. I loved watching cartoons with him. SpongeBob. Hell yes, I can say that I watched it for my son, but that's not entirely true. I myself laughed more than once at what happened there. My wife just rolled her eyes. We also started spending more time with my sister and Jerry. You know, with her, just a friend. We went on double dates when we could get our parents to babysit our three kids. Naomi also started a new tradition game and movie night. I think this was her excuse to spend more time with my sister. But Jerry and I didn't mind. 
We alternated between being at home and playing board games or watching movies. We tried to arrange this at least once every two weeks, but depending on how busy the month was, everything could change. My sister was still working in the prosecutor's office, and sometimes she was just exhausted. Naomi was still working at the gym. Someone was constantly trying to pick her up. If Jerry happened to be working out the night she was working, he kept scaring off those fools. It never stopped being funny. In general, everything went as it should have, at least in my opinion. One day, I was sorting out things in the attic and came across an old box of Naomi's things. I remembered taking it up there many years ago, but I had never looked inside since. Having become interested, I began to sort through it. The box was filled with various memorabilia and other things that seemed to have sentimental value to her. At the very bottom, I found an old photo album. While flipping through it, I found many photographs that I had never seen before. Without a doubt, these were pictures of Naomi when she was a child. The man and woman who appeared in various photos were likely her parents. She never talked much about them, and I became immersed in a visual journey through my wife's childhood. In the few conversations we had about her parents, she only said that they were no longer there. Nothing more. No details about how they died, what memories she had of them, what they did together when she was growing up. Nothing. It always seemed strange and a little unsettling to me, but I assumed it was too painful for her to talk about. We had a whole life ahead of us together. I'll get that story over time. I put everything back in place and didn't mention it. But I hoped that someday she would share this with me. I thought I would at least want to tell Henry about his heritage, so I might have waited until he was a little older. The weekend I became a full-fledged cuckold for the first time is forever etched in my memory. This weekend was both the most exciting and humiliating of my life anxiety multiplied a thousand times. I remember it well. We went to another city for a couple of days to celebrate Naomi's birthday. We had a party for family and friends that afternoon, and then my mom looked after Henry while we were on the plane to the resort. There were spas, casinos, tennis courts, you name it. I wanted to give her a couple of days of relaxation. The first night, I did nothing but sleep. I've been planning a party with Trina for the past two weeks, and it's really exhausting me. Plus the flight, all this made itself felt. Naomi knew I needed some rest, so she went to the spa while I slept. I don't know how long I slept, but I woke up with Naomi clinging to me. Wake up, honey. Mommy needs some love. I was still sleepy, but I knew that in this state she would not accept refusal. I took off my shorts and grabbed the back of her head. She knew what would happen next and eagerly gave me pleasure. She took off her shorts and jumped on me. Leaning her palms on my chest, she moved her hips wildly, enjoying herself. I just got a massage, she said, breathing heavily, looking into my eyes. Now I knew what turned her on so much, so I started asking questions. Was it a man or a woman? Handsome, she breathed. Handsome. Did he touch you? I asked. Yes. Images began to form in my head, and I began to adapt to her rhythm. Where did he touch you? She began to move even faster and harder. My breasts and, oh God, between my legs. In my imagination, I saw him caressing her luxurious body. She probably made the same sounds as she does now. Could she moan for him the way she moaned for me now? Did she raise her butt to give him more access? All this became unbearable for me. Did you let him grope you? I asked. Yes. Did he like it? I continued. Yes. Have you seen his manly place? Oh, God, yes. What did he do to you, Naomi? I shouted. He was caressing me while I give him pleasure, she screamed. She lay on top of me, completely exhausted. Her breathing was deep as she rested her head on my shoulder. Did you really please him? I asked when the euphoria wore off. I have to admit I was a little offended and angry. As I said earlier, nothing brings a man back to reality faster than an orgasm. I didn't finish it. He caressed me so well that it seemed natural. I didn't think much of it because of the bachelorette party where you forced me to please the dancer. Did I force you to please the dancer? As far as I remember, you already did this before you called me. 
She sat up and looked into my eyes. Are you mad at me? I was really angry. She didn't ask permission before she did it. I didn't respond with words, but the look on my face said it all. Sorry, dear. I'm really sorry. I didn't think you'd be angry. I actually did it with that dancer, but after your bet, I thought it was normal. But you let that massage therapist touch you. What the hell, nah? Her eyes filled with tears. Sorry, Josh. I'm really sorry. I didn't think it would upset you. Please forgive me. I couldn't stay mad at her for long. Everything was ambiguous at this stage. We didn't have clear boundaries between what was acceptable and what wasn't. I exhaled and sighed. Don't worry, nah. She smiled with relief and lay back on my shoulder. I heard her quiet sobs. But if we continue this, let's at least respect each other. I don't know about rules, but if there were rules, the first rule would be to not do anything without my knowledge, okay? Okay, darling. We spent the next day sightseeing and doing touristy things. We ate at several restaurants. We went to a wine tasting. We took photos in a photo salon where we dressed up in funny costumes. I was a cowboy and she was a saloon lady. Those fishnet stockings and the low-cut dress suited her perfectly. In the evening, we went to a club that Naomi heard about from someone. It was an over-25s club, so there weren't a lot of young 20-somethings there. Naomi and I danced for a few songs. When we sat down at our table, she asked me to get her a drink, and I went to the bar. It was quite crowded, and it took me a while to get the bartender's attention. When I finally took my order, I returned to the table looking for my wife. Imagine my surprise when I saw that a man was sitting in my place. When Naomi saw me, she smiled and waved. Ronaldo, this is my husband, Josh. Ronaldo extended his hand to me for a handshake. I put the glasses on the table to return the gesture. How do you know my wife, Ronaldo? I didn't want it to sound like an interrogation, but it turned out that way. However, this did not bother him at all but my wife began to babble something incomprehensible. This is the massage therapist who massaged me yesterday, she said with some uncertainty in her voice. Yes, I told your wife about this club when I massaged her yesterday. She said she would come here if she could persuade you. Glad to see she was able to convince you. It seemed like my face showed my emotions clearly because I noticed Naomi begin to shrink in her seat. Is it true? Well, Ronaldo, I need to talk to my wife, so if you don't mind. With these words, I grabbed Naomi's hand and pulled her out of the chair. I practically dragged her along with me as she hurried after me in her heels. What the hell is going on, Naomi? I asked when we left the club. Naomi stammered trying to answer as I glared at her. And here the gallant Ronaldo decided to show chivalry and came to check if the lady needed help. Is everything okay, Naomi? The fact that this insolent person decided to approach us and ask such a question filled me with rage. I could barely restrain myself from attacking him. Ronaldo, this is between me and my wife. So, if you don't get out of here immediately, I'll break all your fingers, starting with the one you popped her with. I shouted so loudly that I attracted the attention of passers-by. Now Naomi has gone from confused to furious. Without saying a word, she turned around and walked towards our rental car. Ronaldo and I continued to stare at each other for a few more seconds before I couldn't take it anymore. Go and try to have sex with someone else's wife, Ronaldo. Mine is closed to you. He looked at me with mockery in his eyes and then definitely licked his fingers. He made his point clear and walked away, leaving me seething with anger. I angrily walked towards the car. What's wrong with you, Josh? I can't believe you humiliated me like that. You dragged me out of the club like a naughty child and screamed at the whole world that Ronaldo touched me. God! She screamed as soon as I approached. Are you serious? You dragged me into going to a club just to meet a guy who groped you, and you have the nerve to be mad at me. Have I humiliated you? You humilized me, I blurted out in response. I saw her face soften at my attack. She looked at me with a thoughtful expression for a few seconds, and then took a deep breath. Josh, do you think I wanted to go to this club to meet Ronaldo? 
Damn, now I understand why you're so angry. What? I didn't go there to meet him. He did tell me about the club, but I had no intention of meeting him. I told him that I would go there only with you, so as not to give him a reason to think that we would meet there. But I still wanted to go because he described the place as interesting. You two looked too comfortable when I went to get drinks. What were you talking about? I asked, suppressing my irritation. She blushed when she remembered this. He said he enjoyed giving me a massage and tried to talk me into other things. Is it true? And what did you answer him? My voice was cold, and I looked carefully into her eyes. Naomi looked upset that I even asked the question. Josh, I have always been faithful to you. I have never done anything that I considered inappropriate. I know the massage has gone too far, but I didn't think it was much different from what we did before. But I would never knowingly do anything to hurt you. Never. You have to trust me. What did you tell him? I insisted. Tears began to form in her eyes as she shook her head, as if she couldn't believe that I was still doubting. I told him I wouldn't cheat on you. I believed her, but it did not relieve all the pain and anger that had accumulated inside me. Would you sleep with him? If you weren't married to me, would you have slept with him? Who cares? I'm married to you, and I know it would hurt you. So no. You didn't answer the question. She sighed heavily, as if she was discouraged by my persistence. If I weren't married to you, then yes, I would sleep with him. Are you happy? I exhaled and started the car so we could drive back to our room. The last day of our busy weekend started off just like the previous two. Naomi got up before me and headed to the spa. When I woke up, I took a shower and waited for her to return. She came back, took a shower, and we went to breakfast together. The rest of the day passed by doing nothing. We forgot about yesterday's quarrel and continued as if nothing had happened. When we returned to the hotel to change clothes and go for a swim, I discovered that a message had been left for me at the counter. It was from Ronaldo. Hey buddy, sorry about yesterday. I didn't mean to make you angry. I was just worried about Naomi when you pulled her away so quickly. I cannot stand by when I think that a woman is being offended. Your wife explained everything to me and said that I owe you an apology. So here's my apology. Ronaldo. Who is this message from, dear? Naomi asked with a naive note in her voice. I looked at her and frowned. You know from whom? It's from your friend, who apologizes for his behavior. Why is he doing this? He apologized because I talked to him this morning when I saw him at the spa. You. Her eyes widened in surprise and anger appeared on her face. No, I didn't go to him for a massage, Josh. God, she said, angrily heading towards the elevators. This woman will drive me to my grave. That evening we found ourselves in the same club again. I was surprised that they let us in at all after yesterday's scene. I just want to let you know in advance, honey. Rinaldo will be here. What the hell, Naomi? I want to leave yesterday behind. We all experienced a misunderstanding and were ashamed. I asked him to come here so we could have a drink together and try to make things better. Okay? I didn't answer. But there was no need. A few seconds later, Ronaldo came to our table. Hey, buddy. No offense. He extended his hand and his expression looked sincere, so I reluctantly shook it. Then everything was like a fog. We took turns buying shots. We ended up having a really good time. At first, Naomi was a bit of a buffer between us, but after the alcohol took its toll, things became less awkward. Before I knew it, we were laughing and joking all together. I even let them dance together. I kept a close eye out for any signs of obscenity. They did dance quite close, but without overt friction or anything too intimate. Naomi then came back to the table and grabbed me to dance with me. Gradually, everything began to take a new turn from friendly to something else. The more Naomi got drunk, the less restrained she became. Then, during one of the dances, all three of us ended up on the dance floor together. Naomi danced with both of us. I was in front of her and Rinaldo was behind. I noticed how his hands slid over her hips. I immediately removed them 
but did not do it too harshly. Maybe it was the alcohol, but for some reason it didn't feel as bad as it should have been to see his hands on her. Naomi kissed me passionately enough to melt the metal and then turned to face Rinaldo. I saw his surprise when she hugged him and pulled him closer. He took a quick glance in my direction to see my reaction, but by that time I was already too hazy from the alcohol. None of the three of us seemed to be in our right minds. I saw his hands fall on her delicious ass, and he pressed her to him. They swayed to the rhythm of the music in close and sensual union. I knew I should have been angry, but I wasn't angry. I heard her whisper something in his ear, but I couldn't make out the words. He didn't answer, he just continued to hug her as they moved to the beat. Suddenly, she abruptly pulled away from him and returned to me. She pressed herself against me again, as she had pressed against him a few seconds ago. You're horny, Josh. I feel it. Does it turn you on, darling? She asked. Yes, I could barely squeeze out as I was overwhelmed with passion. I want you. What if I told you that I want Rinaldo to join us? Her voice was soft and hoarse, but the words struck me like a bolt from the blue. I felt her hot breath on my skin and couldn't believe I was hearing it. What? I asked, out of breath. She looked me straight in the eyes. I said I want you and Rinaldo to have sex with me. Tonight. There was an obvious fire of desire in her eyes. She said this completely seriously, and I felt the alcoholic fog in my head gradually dissipate from her words. She knew what she was doing. Will you let him join us? I didn't know what to say. The feelings inside me were raging in disarray. Passion and jealousy fought with each other until they began to merge into one mixed feeling. It became increasingly difficult to separate them. Her power over me was now complete. I nodded dumbly, unable to say a word. But this was not enough for her. Give me a dollar, Josh. I want you to bet me that I can't take you two into a room and have sex until you're completely exhausted. No, not to our room. I can't. Not there. What if we go to his room? Rinaldo lives in this hotel. Will this work? I nodded again, still in a fog. She smiled at me and extended her hand. I reached into my back pocket and pulled out my wallet. With shaking hands, I pulled out a dollar and gave it to her. Then everything was like a thick fog, an interweaving of naked bodies and sweat. This whole process seemed unreal. I had sex with her, and she simultaneously gave him pleasure, and I was completely indifferent. He then opened the condom package and switched places with me. At some point, I simply stopped participating in what was happening. Everything seemed too wild. I quietly slipped out and stood aside, watching what was happening. I needed to leave. I quickly got dressed in the bathroom while my mind cleared a little. Everything got out of control. I quietly left the room. I frayed my nerves spinning around our hotel room. It's been half an hour since I left Naomi with a near stranger. What the hell am I doing? A threesome with some stranger. Crap, does she even know that I left? I tried to call her, but her phone was turned off. I turned off the light and waited, and he began pacing the room again, and drank several bottles of alcohol from the minibar, and he cursed himself. The uncertainty was tearing me apart. Not knowing what is happening there is like excruciating torture. With every tick of the second hand on my watch, I felt something inside me break. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Half an hour later, the phone suddenly pulled me out of my stupor. I saw that Naomi was calling. Darling, where did you go? She asked me in an alarmed voice. I'm in the room, nah, I answered dryly. Five minutes later, she burst through the door. Her face said just had amazing sex, but it was contorted with worry. She came up to me and wrapped her arms around me. Darling, what happened? She asked, kissing me. I couldn't handle my emotions. I felt simultaneously relieved that my wife was still with me and worried about the line we had crossed. Emotions changed so quickly that it seemed as if a strobe light was flashing in my head. I couldn't get them in order. She took my hand and led me to the bed. Then she slowly turned me back to the bed and gently pushed me. I collapsed helplessly onto the mattress and lay there without resisting. She began to unbuckle my belt and pull down my pants. 
I was on autopilot, so I automatically lifted my hips so she could take them off. Then she started giving me pleasure. It was neither energetic nor passionate. It was like she was making love gently and slowly. I love you so much, Josh. Never forget that, she said. I looked down and saw her looking at me. I didn't even feel it happen. It's just that at some point, I realized that I couldn't hold back any longer. I didn't have time to warn her. I was completely exhausted emotionally. Devastated. I lay on the bed just as powerless. Naomi climbed onto the bed and lay down next to me, laying her head on my chest. She showered me with light kisses and smoothly ran her hand over my stomach. We lay in silence, each immersed in our own thoughts. Did you like it? I asked emotionlessly. She continued to stroke and kiss me. Yes, I liked it. It was very exciting. I've never done anything like this before. I felt her face stretch into a smile. Silence. I didn't know how to react to this. Was I angry? Excited? No, neither one nor the other. I was simply stunned. Would you do it again? I asked. She thought for a minute while continuing to kiss my chest. No, not with him. Relief slowly began to break through the darkness in my head. She's not in love with him. She wasn't going to leave me alone and unhappy. She's still mine. And with someone else? I continued. Maybe. If you argue with me again, she sat down and looked into my eyes. Rinaldo was fun because it was about you, darling. If you don't like it, then I'm not interested either. When I let him touch me, I became excited, knowing that as soon as I returned to the room, I would have sex with you. When I let him have sex with me tonight, I was thinking about you. I didn't think it would be so hard for you. Without you, it's just sex, and I will never trade you for simple sex. She laid her head on my chest again and continued to rub my belly. You and Henry are my world, Josh. Without you too, life has no meaning. I hugged her and kissed the top of her head. We lay in silence, listening to each other's breathing. I didn't know what lay ahead of us. All I knew was that everything was out of control. Everything is still in the past, spring 2014, December 2014. After the incident with Rinaldo, we walked carefully around each other. We avoided mention of this event and continued to live as if nothing had happened. At least it seemed so outwardly. However, each of us dealt with what happened in our own way. Naomi showered me with love and attention. To be honest, it was even a little overwhelming. While I certainly enjoyed it, I still wondered why that was. She always used the word love rather sparingly, unless she messed up and was trying to calm me down. This is exactly what was so alarming. I knew why all these displays of affection were happening, and it inevitably brought me back to the feelings I had experienced after the incident with Rinaldo. For my part, I immersed myself in activities that allowed me to get a little distance from her. I started staying at work a little longer, not enough to arouse suspicion among others, but enough to delay coming home while still maintaining a plausible excuse. I also started jogging and walking. Since her transformation a few years ago, Naomi has constantly encouraged me to start taking better care of myself, so that was understandable too. She said that she would like to run with me, but I brushed off the idea. I told her it would be too humiliating to lose to my wife in a race because I couldn't keep up with her. This, of course, was a matter of male pride. She accepted this explanation, although not without some dissatisfaction, and did not return to the matter. We made love, but the passion is no longer the same. I really have to take a lot of responsibility for this. I couldn't help but wonder if she was comparing me to Rinaldo. When I saw her having sex with him, it was obvious that she was enjoying it. Even when I was no longer in the room, it took her a full 30 minutes to come back. Giving her 10 minutes to get dressed still meant he was having sex with her for a full 15 to 20 minutes after she noticed I was gone. This went on for several weeks. I wasn't ignoring her, I was just trying to come to terms with where we were in our lives. One evening, I was watching Suits when Naomi walked into the room. I didn't notice her right away, but I felt her presence. When I turned around, pain was written on her face. What happened, Nah? I asked. Seeing her like this, all my internal barriers collapsed. 
This look pierced me straight to the heart. I miss you, Josh. I miss us. I don't want to lose you. I waved my hand at her, and she walked over to the sofa where I was sitting. I hugged her and gave her space so she could lie next to me. Instead, she rested her head on my lap. I love you, nah, I said, stroking her hair. I felt her shoulders shake before my pants became wet from her tears. I didn't say anything, I just continued to gently stroke her hair. We remained sitting until the series ended, and then we went to bed. We didn't make love that night, but we slept, hugging each other, clinging to each other until we fell asleep. My icy fortress of loneliness began to melt after that. We were slowly getting back to where we were before that spa weekend. A few weeks after that night on the couch, we were again enjoying the same loving partnership as before. Everything except our sex life is back to normal. It is clear that during this period, we did not try to play the game. Naomi's sex is back to the level. It was before she opened up. I think she was afraid of any reminders of that weekend and what they might do to me. That's why she avoided them. This avoidance affected her libido overall. We still made love, but the fire that had burned within my wife, the fire that I loved so much had gone out. In all other aspects, she remained the same loving wife she had been before. She kissed me goodbye when we parted. We hugged when we went to bed. We watched movies, went on dates, ate together, talked, laughed, hugged, and made love. It was all very pleasant, but for me it seemed a little bland. I know, I know. You need to be happy with what you have. And I was really happy with what I had. But I wanted more. I started missing the game, or at least the energy that was in our house when we played it. Yes, in our daily life everything was cozy and happy, but there was not enough extra excitement. The spontaneity of the game opened a hidden door for us, behind which a new, exciting world awaited us. We closed this door and pretended that the room behind it did not exist. But at the same time, part of the pleasure remained behind this door. This is the double-edged sword of passion. It becomes an addiction. I don't know if it's adrenaline or psychology, but one thing is clear. When you start doing something that gives you a buzz, you start to miss it when you stop. It was already closer to Christmas. We bought gifts. Naomi, as always, was as efficient as possible in creating a list for everyone. She knew which stores had the lowest prices. She even had a chart that showed which products could be found in which stores. She knew them all like the back of her hand. Using this knowledge, she divided the list into groups based on which stores were near each other. I had my list, and she had hers. Being a man, I naturally finished shopping much earlier than she did. I had a list. I knew what I was after. For me, it was simple. Find the goods, pay for the goods, put the goods in the trunk. It's simple. But my wife acted a little differently. Like a typical woman, she found the items she wanted looked at the windows for what she would buy later, talked to passing shoppers about how crazy the stores were this season, discussed with another mother who had children around Henry's age what they were buying for them, window shopping again, and then finally calling me to find out where I was. The complete opposite of my lightness. When she called me, I was already stuffed with pepperoni pizza from Esparo, washed down with a large glass of cola, and ate a cinnabon roll. Since this was one of the few opportunities to eat without the supervision of a healthy Nazi, I didn't hold back. She told me to meet her at some shoe store, so I went looking for her. When I arrived, I didn't immediately enter the store. I watched her from outside. A man stood next to her, and they were talking about something. He had a shoe in his hand and was pointing out various details as he spoke, so I assumed he was talking about its features. It was obvious that he was flirting with her. This surprised me because in any other situation I would have taken him for a gay man. However, judging by the way he looked at my wife's breasts, he was clearly interested in women. I also paid attention to Naomi. The sparkle in her eyes. Smile. Touching his hand. Oh my gosh, she flirted back. It was so nice to see her with the vivacity that I missed. She was in her element now and I have to admit, I liked it. Finally, she noticed me and waved. The shoe salesman didn't look all that happy when he saw me. As I approached, Naomi introduced us. 
Honey, this is Chris. Chris, this is Josh, my husband. Chris shook my hand and smiled, but I could see that I was the last person he wanted to meet. Naomi continued to talk about the shoes she was looking at, talking about all the wonderful things she and Chris discussed. Chris smiled at her, said he had to help other customers, and disappeared. I would really like these shoes. Don't they make my legs look amazing, honey? If we hadn't spent so much today, I would have bought them and shown them to you. Her voice finally broke through my thoughts. Suddenly my brain switched to lust mode. It was time to wake up the Kraken. Why don't you buy them, nah? She looked at me with bewilderment. Because we spent over $700, honey. You know how much we plan to spend for Christmas. These shoes are out of budget. I bet you a dollar that you can't stick to your budget. Her eyes opened wide in surprise. I simply smiled at her and gave her time to process my words. What do you want to say, Josh? Nothing special. I just bet you can't find a way to stay on budget and still buy these shoes. I smiled at her as if I didn't mean anything special. She looked at me warily. Josh, stop it. We're leaving, she said, putting the shoe on the display window and heading towards the exit. I understand if you don't think you can do it, I said casually, shrugging, trying to get her excited. She stopped and turned to face me. There was nothing on her face that could be read. No, Josh, no. I don't want a repeat of what happened with Rinaldo. I can't go through this again. I don't want to risk losing you. So you don't want to do it. Are you saying you're not intrigued? That's not what I'm saying, Josh. I have no problems with the game. I have a problem with the possibility of losing you. I understand now. Nah. Then the situation got out of control. I didn't expect something like Rinaldo to happen. It was a shock for me. One minute we're just a couple showing off, and the next we're just three of us with a guy I don't like. I didn't take it well, but I miss what it was. I miss the excitement that the game brought. It's obvious that she brings out the real savage out of you. And I like this savage. Are you serious, Josh? I noticed that excitement appeared in her eyes, although she tried to hide it. Yes, nah. Josh, what if? This is a very special dollar, nah, I said, interrupting her, waving a dollar bill in front of her face. After all, we spent so much today. This makes it rare. To get it, you'll have to do something special. Her face twisted into a sly smile as she gave in. There was a fire in her eyes. I could almost feel her energy. It was intoxicating. What should I do, Josh? I really want that dollar. Well, I'm not sure you'll be able to do this, but I'll tell you anyway. First you have to go to the toilet and take off your panties. She giggled. So far I like everything. Then I'll go to the car. I'm very tired and want to rest. And honestly, I don't think I can stand here while you try on one pair of shoes after another. So I'm just trying on shoes. What's so difficult about this? I'm glad you asked. You won't try them on. Chris will be there. And you can't adjust your skirt even once. Her mouth opened in surprise when she realized what I meant. But Josh, if he lifts my foot to put on the shoe, he'll definitely see. Her voice trailed off. Oh my God, I didn't think about it, Naomi. But this is not my problem. This is a problem that you will have to deal with on your own. Her face lit up with excitement. The last condition, you must buy shoes. Large discounts should be made on these shoes. I'll look at the check. With these words, I left the store with her bags in my hands. I put them in the trunk and listened to the radio for about an hour. Then I saw Naomi rushing to the car with her head down. So how, I asked when she got into the car. Her cheeks were crimson with embarrassment. She could hardly look me in the eyes. I did everything you said. And he spent an hour trying on my shoes. At first everything was businesslike. But when he looked under my skirt and realized that I was not hiding, he began to lift my leg higher and higher. After a while I started to feel how I smelled, I was so excited. With every word she said, I became very excited. I had to grab hold of it so that it wouldn't twitch. Did you buy shoes? I asked, having difficulty finding words. She shook her head. He couldn't. His manager was nearby. But he said he was closing at nine today. 
then he will be alone. He said that if I came back alone, then he could think of something. When she finished, I completely understood her hint. If I come back alone, something can be worked out. I felt her hand touch my arm. I looked into her eyes and saw lust, pure lust. Her hand was careful. She pulled mine aside, unzipping the zipper. She stopped giving me pleasure and looked at me, but her hand continued to stroke me. I really need this dollar, Josh. My mission is not yet complete. I need to be back at nine and pick up these shoes. She started giving me pleasure again when I died and went to heaven. Naomi. She looked at me. Her face was worried. Josh, I don't want to do anything that could hurt us. I'm not going to put you in situations like I did with Ronaldo anymore. If you want me to do something, you have to tell me. You have to take the lead. Okay, nah, I understand. Do you want me to come back tonight and bring these shoes, Josh? You know what he wants. You have to say it. There was no seductive tone in her voice. This was serious. It kind of killed the playful mood. Do you want these shoes? I asked. Yes. Her voice was soft, almost a whisper. We looked at each other and laughed. Our eyes intermingled and displayed messages of love. Present September 2015. Naomi and I attended several weekly classes with Beth. I'd like to say that they bridged the gap between us and helped us overcome it, but they didn't. These sessions were confusing. At this stage, Beth avoided cheating altogether. She simply made us relive the story of our lives together. We recounted how we met, how I proposed, the first time we had sex, the first time I said I love you, and so on. While I enjoyed the trip down memory lane, I didn't feel like we were addressing the question of why we came to counseling. However, I found out who her lover was. We didn't talk about it, or I didn't really listen, until it came up in one of the sessions. Beth quickly brought the conversation back to that point, but I found out who he was. Guys, I hate telling you this part because it's so cliché, but here it is. This guy is her boss. Yeah, this is the new boss who was hired at the gym to replace the one who had worked there for 10 years. Apparently, the old boss was offered a job running the new Walmart, and it was too good to pass up. Naomi was in charge of all personal trainers when the new boss was appointed. She no longer trained one-on-one -on -one unless no one else was scheduled. She had three trainers under her, so she only had to conduct classes from time to time. She didn't really need the confidence boost anymore to be hit on, so the boost didn't have any impact on our sex life. I remember her mentioning her boss several times. She described him as loud, abrupt, bossy, and something of a bully. She didn't seem too impressed with him at the moment, so I didn't pay too much attention to it. So we're at the next meeting. I admit, I'm starting to lose hope. I feel like I'm no closer to figuring out what went wrong than I was before we started coming. Without finding out what went wrong, I can't trust her. Without this, I will not be able to stay in this marriage. As much as it would destroy me, I would have to let Naomi go. When Naomi and I first arrived today, something was very different. First of all, there was no quiet music playing in the background. Secondly, we were sitting opposite a grimly serious Beth. The sudden change in her usual behavior made the tension palpable. Okay, Josh and Naomi, I feel like we have reached a turning point in our journey together. I enjoyed hearing your marriage story. Now I want to know about the past. Naomi, I want to hear about your parents. Beth's cold gaze is both soft and serious. There is nothing in her face of the warm woman who greeted us that first week. This is a clinical phenomenon. Almost cold. I look at my wife, who even turns pale. I see her lips tremble and her wide open gaze looks frozen. I've never seen her like this. They're dead. It's like a punch in the face. Every time I heard her say this in the past, it was the first time I knew she was lying. I'm almost out. But I need to stop listening to this. Naomi, I want to hear about your parents. Beth repeats. Her tone shows that she won't let it go. I sense my wife's indecision and fear. She looks like a mouse cornered, like a little girl hiding under the covers and hoping the boogeyman will go away. Part of me wants to jump in there and tell Beth to go to hell. 
I want to shout at her to stop bullying my wife. She clearly doesn't want to talk about it. However, I am silent. I know it's important. It's been a while. I just couldn't see it. How did they die, Naomi? My wife looks at the floor and tears stream down her face. Beth hands her a tissue, but we both patiently let her recover so she can continue. My daddy shot my mommy. I almost screwed up when I heard that. What the hell? How could she not tell me this? However, I keep my feelings to myself because I need to hear the rest. I caught my mom cheating on him with my Uncle Ricky. One day I came home from school and they were kissing. She wipes her nose with a napkin. It almost breaks me to see her like this. It also makes me angry that I'm only finding out about this now, after everything we've been through together. When I encountered her, I called her a woman of easy virtue. I told her that she was an easy woman and that I was going to tell my father about this, but she begged me not to. She promised never to do it again. Naomi pauses to swallow the frog stuck in her throat. But I must say, I couldn't just let her get away with it. This was wrong. I felt that my father had a right to know what kind of woman he was married to. Did you tell him, Naomi? Beth asked softly. I think she understood that Naomi needed help getting through this labyrinth of repressed memories. Naomi simply nodded and was overcome by a wave of loud sobs. He killed her, and it was all because of me, she screamed. I immediately reached out to hug her without waiting for a signal from Beth. This time she didn't stop me. It's not your fault, dear. It was her mistake. She changed it, I said softly, trying to calm her down. I thought I was saying the right thing, but Naomi abruptly pushed me away. I looked into her face and saw pure rage. No, it was his fault. Her voice was full of poison. She sounded almost demonic. I wanted to say something again, but Beth seemed to read my thoughts and sent me a shut up and stay out of it look. After he was tried and convicted of her murder, a visitor came to me. His son, his damn son, he was three years younger than me. It turns out that dear daddy had another woman, a whole different family. Naomi now stood and spoke with such force that a vein bulged on her forehead. My damn father has been cheating on my mother for years. Moreover, he mocked her. He humiliated her, called her a useless, mumbling creature. And she started it. She never said a word. She let that bastard trample her. What a pathetic, cowardly little bitch. Her anger was so strong that I became scared. I have never seen her in such a state. If she had grabbed the nearest sharp object and started poking me with it, I wouldn't have been more surprised than I would have been at her outburst. For years he cheated on her with another woman. For years my mother sat in this joyless marriage and let him do whatever he wanted. She endured his insults and betrayals without saying a word. And when she finally found something that brought her some peace, I I. Her voice suddenly stopped and her face quickly changed from uncontrollable anger to deep despair. Her heart was broken. It has been broken for years. I just didn't notice it. Beth's soft, soothing voice broke the silence. What did you do, Naomi? It was as if Beth was drawing the poison out of her. She needed Naomi to speak the words to free herself from this burden. As with poisoning, everything must come out. I took away from her only joy. My father and I killed my mother. All three of us sat in silence after she finished. The only sound was Naomi's heavy breathing. I was shocked. Never, in all the years that we knew each other, did I even suspect that she carried this terrible secret within herself. I can't imagine how she felt, living with so much guilt over her mother's death, plus hatred for her father. My God, how could she even function? Where is your father now, Naomi? Beth asked after a minute. Naomi gave her an angry look and sharply spat. In prison, I hope they bully him every day, if there is even a drop of justice in the world. Her voice was filled only with hatred. Beth decided we needed to take a five-minute break. Naomi needed to calm down. I needed to get out into the fresh air. So Beth asked me to go out for a while and come back when I was ready. When I returned, Naomi was calmer. Her face was stained with tears and her makeup was smudged, but her rage and anger had cooled to a gentle simmer. She saw me and rushed into my arms. 
I hugged her, and we stood there for a few minutes before sitting down. Well, I think we finally made some progress, Beth said in her usual cheerful voice. We both looked at her like she was crazy, but this didn't bother her. Do you have any questions, Josh? she asked, pointing to my notebook. I didn't even think about writing anything down, although a thousand questions were spinning in my head. Probably the first question is, why? Why didn't you ever tell me any of this? We've been married for eight years. How could you lie to me all these years? Naomi looked at the floor and sobbed. She really looked to Beth for support, who just sat there and nodded. I didn't want to think about it, Josh. I buried the hatred in the past. It was easier for me to think that they were both dead. They are dead to me. You would never have met my O Kenny. There was no point in stirring it up. I knew that at that moment I should have shown empathy and tried to understand her. But I couldn't. I felt my own anger. So you just lied to me throughout our entire marriage, after all the trust I put in you. You lied to me on. She burst into tears. I know, Josh. I know. While Naomi and I exchanged words, Beth sat nodding her head and scribbling notes in her notebook. But she didn't interfere. Finally, she decided to intervene. I have a question, Naomi. Why was it so difficult for you to fully trust Josh in the beginning? Why was it difficult for you to give up your freedom? Naomi's face brightened as if it had dawned on her. I never wanted any man to have power over me. I couldn't bear the thought of becoming as pathetic as my mother, she said out loud, but it seemed like she was saying it more to herself. Beth just sat there and nodded. When you played the game, did you feel the same sense of freedom that you had before meeting Josh? Naomi nodded, looking at the floor. If this freedom is so important to you, why did you marry him then? This question was so precise that it shocked both of us. B, because I love him. He makes me feel like he will never hurt me. He, the complete opposite of your father. Beth interjected. Naomi looked at her for a moment, then lowered her eyes and nodded. We're almost out of time, but we have such a good flow that I'm postponing my next meeting. Wait a second, okay? We nodded in agreement as she went out to talk to her secretary. When she returned, we continued. We're at the point where I think we need to discuss this novel of yours. Tell me about this man again, Naomi. Past December 2014. With the reintroduction of gaming into our lives, thanks to Chris the Shoe Salesman, our erratic fun gradually resumed. The balance of our lives has shifted a little. Everything around seemed brighter and more exciting. Even something as innocent as helping my wife in the kitchen turned into a test of our endurance so as not to lash out at each other. We started playing again with the new boundaries we had set. Naomi did return to the mall that evening and pick up her shoes. Not just at a discount, she got them for free. Not for money, of course, but it cost her a blowjob in the back room of the store. These shoes became a kind of trophy for us. New borders have become the rules of the game. We didn't write them down on paper, of course, but we discussed them, clarifying our expectations. Here's what the rules looked like. 1. We never played with anyone we knew personally. Innocent flirting with our mutual male friends was acceptable, since I also sinned the same with my wives, but no drunken antics, which I had previously allowed myself to do. We realized how confusing and dangerous it could be if we continued like this. 2. Strong flirting and even groping other men was okay, but no touching under clothing unless in agreement with Rule 3. 3. Any actions had to be agreed upon and planned by both of us before they were carried out. No sudden surprises like there were with Ronaldo or at the bachelorette party. 4. This was the most important rule. Naomi was never to have sex with another man outside of play. Any sexual activity she performed with another man was meant to enhance our own sexual relationship. The game isn't as crazy as it used to be. With the exception of Chris and a few other instances, we didn't really include any actual sex. We reserved sexual intercourse for our own bedroom. There were times when we played several times a week. More often than not, it came down to Naomi simply showing things to people or flirting to see what she could get from guys. Sometimes a whole month passed between our bets. 
There was no specific schedule, but the very fact of the game's existence excited both of us. Knowing there was always an opportunity to play energized us in our bedroom. Naomi had the perfect balance between that freedom that made her glow and a happy marriage that gave her support. It made her happy, which in turn made me happy. Everything worked. The question probably running through your head is, did I get the same freedom that she did? Do I think she would let me sleep with other women? To be honest, I don't know. This was never discussed. I believe she would allow it. She would be fair. But would she enjoy it as much as I do? Of course not. I'm sure she would hate it. But I really believe that she would not deny me something that brought her pleasure, even if she really didn't want it. However, let's be honest. Naomi and I were madly in love with each other. We never tried to hide our love in public. Women are less likely to take risks with a man when he openly shows love and affection to his wife. If this guy can show all these touching, amor traits and still try to lure her into bed, it will most likely turn her off rather than attract her. All those qualities that made him attractive will now make him seem like a slug. She will even feel sorry for his wife. At least that's what a quality woman I was interested in would do. With men, everything is simpler. We are, at our core, dogs. The longevity of the relationship is not important to us. If a woman kisses her husband and tells him he's the one, and then turns around and tries to seduce another guy, he'll likely feel aroused by it. In his head, he is taking something that clearly belongs to someone else. Every time he has sex with her, he will think about how her poor husband is sitting at home waiting for her to return. When we men find ourselves in a situation where we can win a woman who belongs to someone else, we feel superior. It's like we're beating this guy. It gives us confidence and makes us feel more like a man. This is why we are more likely to have sex with married women. We don't care about her moral state. Moreover, the more immoral it is, the better for the short term. As long as we can say that we were there, we feel this forbidden pleasure, and we like it. I understand, I'm generalizing now. Of course, not every man is like this, but I'm willing to bet that we all know at least one man who is like that. I'm also willing to bet that many rule followers secretly fantasize about being that way and would do so if they had the chance. There are thousands of sex movies that use this exact plot to enliven men's fantasies. So I didn't have as many opportunities to sleep with women as Naomi did. The only way I could get a woman into bed was if I pretended that our relationship could develop into something more. After I broke Mel's heart, I couldn't do it to another woman. Besides, I didn't need another woman. I got more sex from Naomi than King Solomon did from his thousand concubines. The fire that had reignited within her was once again indomitable. There were times when I was unable to satisfy her and I had to use her sex toys. Honestly, I didn't need more sex. Yes, I hear you guys. A happy cuckold remains faithful while his useless slutty wife pleases and caresses half the city. Well, as you wish, I was happy. She was happy. Henry was happy. What harm did we cause? We were happy for several months. The episode with Chris happened in December, and we played, enjoyed, and had fun until the end of the summer. And then everything started to fall apart. Yes, I know you've been waiting for this moment. Well, here he is. It all started when she came home from work in a terrible mood. She didn't kiss me hello as usual, didn't pay attention to Henry, and went straight to the bedroom, closing the door behind her. This seemed very strange to me, but not enough to sound the alarm. I continued my evening with Henry, occasionally glancing upward, thinking about my wife. But she never came downstairs all evening. When I went up to the room, she was lying in the dark. A casual observer might have thought she was sleeping, but I knew she was not. Her breathing was not deep. She was awake. I took a shower and lay down in bed next to her. She lay with her face turned away from me, so I pressed myself against her and put my arm around her waist. I felt her take my hand and move it away. Please, dear, not today. I was stunned. She had never pushed away my hugs before. This morning I had to tear her away from me in order to get to work. What could change in one day? Confused, I returned to my side of the bed. 
we lay in silence together, but as if in completely different worlds. My anxiety only increased when I felt the bed shake next to me. Naomi cried quietly. I came to the conclusion that something happened at work. This was the only possible factor between morning and evening. Was she fired, or did someone do something? Various guesses were spinning in my head, but nothing converged. I realized that the only way to find out was for my wife to tell me herself. From that moment, our personal hell began. After that night, all signs of affection from Naomi ceased. She became a completely different person. She didn't laugh anymore. She didn't want to be near me. She wasn't interested in the game. There wasn't even any flirting. She seemed to completely withdraw into herself and became withdrawn and gloomy. Every day she went to work, returned home, and immediately went to the bedroom. When I tried to talk to her, she became angry and aggressive. To be honest, I didn't know what to do. After three weeks of this behavior, I finally gave up. I tried to be patient. I tried to gently figure out what was going on. I even tried using small gifts and compliments, but all of this was met with hostile reactions from her. I realized that I had to act somehow. So when she left for work, I took Henry to my sister's for a few hours. I told her I needed to talk to Naomi and I didn't want Henry around. When Naomi returned home, again in her usual depressed mood, and tried to walk past me into the bedroom, I grabbed her hand. Naomi, what the hell is happening to you? Let me go, Josh. I don't want to argue with you today. I don't have the strength to do this. She didn't even look me in the eyes when she said that. Fine. Then tell me where to send the papers, I replied. Her gaze instantly focused on me. What papers? You know what papers. If you suddenly stopped loving me and started hating me, at least be honest and say so. No matter how much I love you, I don't want to live with a person who doesn't want to be with me. I saw her face change. Her expression became softer, doomed. I even noticed how her eyes filled with tears. What's happening to us, nah? What have I done? Tears instantly flowed down her cheeks. She turned away from me, and her body seemed to go limp. Oh, Josh, please don't leave me, she sobbed, throwing herself into my arms. I hugged her, and her quiet tears turned into loud sobs. I was so happy that I decided to take Henry to my sister. What happened, nah? There's something you need to tell me, honey. I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Please don't make me talk, Josh. Forgive me for being a bitch. Please, I don't want you to hate me. I gently stroked her head, pressing her cheek to my chest. The tears didn't stop. Her body shook with sobs. I could never hate you, darling. There's nothing you could do to make me hate you. Josh, I cheated on you. Well, except for this. Present September 2015. So, Naomi, tell me how your romance began, Beth said evenly. I don't know how she could remain so calm. Everything inside me was turning over. I had been waiting for a long time for us to approach this topic, but now that it had come, I didn't want to hear anything. Naomi and I never discussed the details of her infidelity. We couldn't because every time it came up, I started getting angry and she felt like the last creature. But now, with Beth as a neutral intermediary, I will have to endure and listen to the end. Well, Mark became a manager after Phil went to work at Walmart. Within a week, he began flirting with all the women at work. He even tried to pick up some clients. I just ignored him, thinking he was an idiot. She glanced at me, trying to gauge how I would take her words. Frankly, it was hard to listen to this. She hadn't even gotten to the most important part yet, and I already felt nauseous. Because of the game Josh and I played, I sometimes let men flirt with me. Sometimes a client would try to touch me discreetly. I sometimes allowed it, pretending not to notice, because I knew that Josh and I would use it later. One day Mark noticed a client being very bold with me. He also noticed that I didn't stop him. Later, he forced me into the back room and said that if he had known that training with me would give such bonuses, he would have signed up for free classes himself. Since he was annoying me, I slapped him and told him to go to hell. This was not a slight slap in the face. I hit him with all my might. His head almost turned around. 
When he turned back to me, I expected him to be angry, but he just smiled. He said that he would better sleep with me, and he added that he likes it rough. Someone came in and interrupted us, so he left me alone that day. But then he started stalking me. Every day he made lewd comments about how he wanted to do personal training with me. The more I saw him, the more I hated him. Plus, he was a real bully. He yelled at people who made mistakes, calling them stupid and slow. One day, he brought one of the girls to tears by calling her stupid. I simply ignored him. And then one day, I met his wife. She was so soft and quiet. It seemed that she was afraid to even open her mouth in his presence. He called her all sorts of offensive words, such as stupid bitch and fearful creature. I hated him, but I also hated her for allowing him to treat her like that. I looked at Beth and saw her nod approvingly, as if she was beginning to understand the whole picture. I also began to understand what was happening. Naomi continued to speak, not noticing how things began to take shape. Then one day he forced me into the locker room when the gym was closing, asked me about one-on-one -on -one training. I asked him, what about your wife? And he said, fuck that mouse bitch, I want you. Naomi paused, wiping her nose on her sleeve. Beth handed her a napkin and we gave Naomi a moment to compose herself. How did you feel when he called his wife a mouse bitch, Naomi? Beth asked carefully. I understood where she was going with this. Everything became even clearer. I was furious. I hit him in the face. I broke his lip. But he just looked at me and grinned. Is that all you can do, bitch? He said. Then he grabbed my wrist and kissed me. It wasn't really a kiss. He just stuck his tongue down my throat. I pulled my hand away and pushed him away. Apparently she grabbed his shirt because it was torn. On his chest, I saw scratches that I think were left by my nails when I tore his shirt. Then he said, go to daddy, bitch. After that, everything was a blur. We tore each other's clothes off. I had sex with him right on the floor. I was furious the whole time I was doing this. I hit him. I slapped him. I called him a worthless piece of crap. Her last statement shocked me painfully. But strangely enough, it doesn't hurt as much because I'm starting to understand where it all comes from. Beth brings everything home. What did he look like, Naomi? When I hear her describe this guy, my eyes open completely. The realization hit Naomi like a ton of bricks. She really starts to shake. My God, I'm so screwed. I hold her and she starts crying again. Beth even breaks protocol and comes over to our side. No, sweetie. You didn't screw up. You have held these demons within yourself for so long that you have had no way to understand them or release them. She says, rubbing Naomi's arm soothingly. The sobbing subsides a little, so Beth moves on. When you and Mark were together, how did you feel? I hated him. I hated his wife. I hated myself. What made you keep coming back to him? Naomi thought for a moment, sobbing quietly. No matter what I did to him, he kept chasing me, like a pathetic puppy. He was pathetic, and I made him that way. Beth looks at me and sees that I have a question, even though I haven't written it down. She nods, inviting me to speak. Why didn't you tell me about this, nah? You should have told me. She looks at me with the saddest eyes I've ever seen on her. I was embarrassed, Josh. It was the first time in my life that I felt ashamed of what I did. I hated myself for sleeping with him. It made me feel insignificant, but it also gave me a sense of power that I never had before. I didn't want you to see me like this, so that you know that part of me is capable of what I did to him. The fury I was capable of. Beth returns and sits in her chair. For the first time since all of this started, I feel optimistic about us. Yes, we're in pain right now, but that's because we just came out of cancer surgery. I think this is a good place to stop. Naomi, you were amazing today, so brave. Naomi actually blushes and smiles when Beth applauds her. But before you go, I have to tell you this, Naomi. To completely get rid of this demon, you will have to face it. And I mean that literally. You have the opportunity and means to free yourself. 
But to do this, you will have to do something you won't like. We sit waiting to see what Beth will say next. Her face is deadly serious, but also reassuring. You will have to forgive your father. I think you need to face him and confront him. Tell him everything you couldn't say when you were younger. I believe you need this to forgive him. Only then can you forgive yourself and heal. Once again, my wife looks unsure. If Beth had told her to jump into a pit of snakes, Naomi would have looked at her with more enthusiasm than she did now. She glances at me as if trying to figure out what I think about this. I smile at her and gently stroke her cheek. You are the strongest woman I know, nah. If anyone can beat this damn demon, it's you, baby. And I will be by your side every step of the way. Her face lights up with a smile, and she hugs me so tightly I can barely breathe. She almost chokes me, but at this moment it doesn't seem important. I look over her shoulder and see Beth winking at me as if to say, Great, Josh. Great. Present October 2015. Naomi Narrator. I listen to the background noise of walkie-talkies and the sound of doors slamming shut with certainty. Quiet conversations around serve as white noise, while others talk excitedly about loved ones they miss so much. I would like to share their feelings. I wish the white walls and gloomy ceiling lights didn't create the feeling of doom that pervades my entire body. Unlike others here, I didn't drive five hours and twenty-five minutes to see my loved one. I came here, to this dark place, to see the hated. The prison guards watch each of us closely with detached interest, running a detector over our bodies to detect unknown metal objects. When this stage is completed, they wave us on to the next inspection station. This place is so cold, deprived of warmth. It literally makes me shake. I can't imagine a worse place to be for years. Fine. Once inside the visiting room, I take a seat at the table in the farthest corner. I sit down so that I can see the door through which the guests of this establishment will enter. I need to see him when he comes in. I want to watch it coming. Call it the instinct of self-preservation, but the main rule in order not to be taken by surprise is to never let the enemy see your back. The door swings open and orange jumpsuits fill the room. Faces that have probably done terrible things turn into soft smiles when they see the only people in the world who care. It would have been touching if I had seen it in different circumstances. And then he appeared. The monster from my nightmares. The one who stole my parents from me. A hypocritical bastard who thought he had the right to ruin three lives. I haven't seen him for 18 years, more than half my life. I always thought that I might never see him again. But I'm not okay. The current state of my marriage is proof of that. He doesn't look like the man I remember. The eyes of that little girl watching his cold face many years ago made him some kind of evil deity in my mind. He was immortal. His soulless eyes were filled with hatred as he looked at the lifeless body he had killed. In my mind, he was invulnerable. Like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. No, this person is not him. His body sagged as if the weight of the overalls was too heavy for him. His face has aged, but it seems that sadness and remorse have added to his years. It's not just the remorse that a person feels when he does something bad. No, his remorse is deeper. As if for him life is devoid of meaning and joy. It's as if he wakes up every morning and curses God. Perhaps there is justice. Naomi, he asks, approaching me. He doesn't seem to believe his eyes. He blinks as if trying to make sure I'm really there. He awkwardly kisses my cheek. I just sit there, tense, showing no warmth or affection. Hey, Kenny, I say quietly. I hate the sound of my voice. He seems so weak. I wanted to come here and show him how strong I am. I wanted my voice to be stern and confident, maybe even a little scary, but seeing him so defeated made me lose it all. I also notice how he flinches when I call him Kenny instead of Dad. Long time no see, baby, he says, sitting down opposite me. I try to smile, but I can't. I also feel a wave of discomfort from his affectionate treatment. So what do I owe this pleasure to? He tries to start a conversation that seems to elude both of us. My stomach is full of knots. I rehearsed a whole speech. 
For days I thought in my head what I would tell him when I saw him. I knew how I would say it. She even prepared sarcastic responses to any of his possible remarks. But all this disappeared. I regret that I came here alone. Why did I tell Josh to stay at the hotel? Why do I need to prove that I'm strong enough to handle this on my own? Why can't I trust my husband at times like these? Why, why, why? I, I came to talk to you. I'm seeing a counselor, and she thought. She thinks. We both think it's time to talk. I'm babbling like an idiot. Weak idiot. Come on, Naomi. Get your act together. He suddenly can't maintain eye contact. I notice how his eyes dart along the walls, avoiding my gaze. However, this works to my advantage, because now it's difficult for me to look him in the eye. I think you want to talk to me about what I did. His voice sounds as weak and uncertain as mine. My God, the monster from my nightmares is getting nervous because of me. Yes, Kenny, I want to talk to you about the day you killed your mom. I'm glad to hear that my voice has regained some confidence. I use this to gather my emotions and force myself to look him in the eye. Okay, baby, what do you want to know? What do I want to know? What do I want to know? What the hell do I want to know? What the hell kind of question is this? Suddenly, I feel anger building inside me. The suppressed anger I felt in Beth's office when I was pouring out my memories comes back, overwhelming me. It literally suffocates me. It is so thick and hot. I feel him distort my face into a grimace. I want to know why you shoot my mom. What fucking right did you have to kill her? I feel tears welling up in my eyes, but damn it, I won't let him see them. He doesn't deserve to see my vulnerability. He is my enemy. Baby. Don't call me that again. I am not your baby. I am that girl whose life you stole, you fucking monster. I scream so loudly that my voice echoes around the room, drowning out all other conversations. More precisely, those conversations that took place. Now there is silence all around, and all eyes are directed at us. The guard gives me a warning look and looks like he's about to approach, but I see my father Kenny motioning for him not to interfere, pleading with his eyes. Naomi, I'm so sorry, he says, reaching out to take mine, but I pull them away and look at him with an icy gaze that could freeze fire. He withdraws his hands and places them on the table in front of him. There is not a day that I don't regret what I did. What I did to your mother is unforgivable. Why did you do this, Dad? Why did you shoot her when you yourself were doing the same thing at that time? My voice becomes firm and furious, and I throw these words like a blow to the most vulnerable place. His face darkens as I say the last words. I take it you know about Sandy and your brother? I chuckle sarcastically. Yes, Dad. He appeared when you were convicted. It seems that he felt it necessary to meet with me, since we have so much in common. Of course you didn't kill his mother. I see how every sarcastic word I say kills him a little more inside. Part of me enjoys this. If I hurt him, fine. What he feels now are mild consequences compared to the nightmare he gave me. Relatives who didn't want to take care of me, social workers and psychiatrists who analyzed my emotions, children who teased me about my father being a murderer and my mother being a prostitute. Yes, to hell with both of them. That's why I spent years trying to forget it all. Change this. Change yourself. I had to. I couldn't survive if I didn't leave it behind and I didn't have the strength to really deal with it, so I just eliminated it. It was easier than the alternative, and it worked. For the most part, maybe, no, it didn't actually work. I tried to be independent and not need anyone, especially in a man. Lying hypocrites. They are ready to sleep with anyone and then burn the woman at the stake because she did not remain faithful to them. Men are pathetic creatures, not good for anything other than a good night in bed. Let everyone go to hell. Except for Josh. He's so different. No matter what happens, he always puts me first. My Josh, what would I do without you? Kenny's voice intrudes into my thoughts again, interrupting my journey through the minefield of memories. I wish I could undo what I did to your mother. All this, I treated her terribly and it haunts me every day. 
Her face is the first thing I see in the morning and the last thing I see at night. He looks like he's about to cry. His eyes look directly into mine, begging me to sympathize with him. Love him. But I can't. I'm too far from this. In another hemisphere. At the same time, I can't help but feel sorry for him in a way. His life sucks. He's lonely. He has no future and no one who cares about him. A terrible way to live, even for a monster like him. Why did you do this? And more importantly, why did you even marry her? I ask, softening my tone. I no longer feel the need to beat and torture him. It's like hitting a wounded animal. I never loved your mother. I know it sounds terrible, but it's true. It was supposed to be for one night. I was drunk. She was drunk. We had sex in a damn toilet stall. They didn't even take their clothes off, damn it. I sit back, digesting this information. Of course, I always suspected that he didn't love my mother. It is impossible for a man to love a woman and treat her the way he treated my mother. But it's one thing to know it in your head and another to hear it out loud. This is shocking. Every child wants to believe that he is the result of a union based on love and not on drunken passion. God, no wonder I'm so broken. I was a running back in college. Fast as hell. Strong. I wanted to go pro. Everyone said I had a chance. Your mother was a local girl who loved hanging out with college boys. She was even close with several of my teammates. I was just the one lucky enough to knock her up. If I thought I couldn't feel any worse than before, his last words proved me wrong. I'm shocked. So I was the reason they were stuck in this terrible marriage. He seems to have read my expression correctly because he immediately tries to explain himself. It's not your fault, honey. It was your mother's and my choice to do this in that cubicle. I was too drunk to put on a condom. You had no choice in the matter. What happened was simply the consequences of stupidity. I calmed down a little, although I hate that he called me the consequence of stupidity. Every word he says breaks me apart, but I know I have to let him continue. When your mother told me she was pregnant, I almost went crazy. At first I didn't even believe that you were mine. I don't know how she herself realized that you were mine. She was not the most faithful woman in the world. But when you were born, a DNA test showed that I was lucky to become your father. He grins, enjoying the irony, completely unaware of how low it makes me feel. My father always talked about how important it is to fulfill your obligations. Do what's right. So when your mother gave birth to you, he said he needed to make her a decent woman. You deserve a family, he said. After all, you were the only one of us who did nothing wrong. So we got married in court. None of us wanted to be together. I was constantly mocked for marrying the girl everyone else was with. My teammates, classmates, even the coaching staff talked about me behind my back. I started skipping workouts to avoid them. Started skipping classes. And your mother always demanded something. Eventually, my playing began to deteriorate. I missed a block here, lost the ball there, and didn't catch a pass a couple of times. I was constantly distracted between the ridicule of my comrades and my responsibilities to my family. Soon my scholarship was taken away and I was unable to complete my studies. Of course I blamed your mother for this. Every time I looked at her, I saw a ruined future. And I hated her for it. Your mother had low self-esteem even before we met. That's why she let guys do whatever they wanted to her. A couple of compliments and a few drinks and she was yours for the night. So she simply tolerated my bullying. It was in her nature. The only one who truly loved her was your uncle. Poor Ricky. He considered her a saint. He didn't care about her past. More than once people joked that she got pregnant from the wrong brother. To be honest, I also sometimes wished that he would get her pregnant instead of me. But we are all trapped. My brother even begged her to divorce me so he could marry her. She never did this, of course, because she was deathly afraid of me. But I saw in her eyes that she wanted me to free her so she could be with him. But I couldn't do it. I thought my future was ruined because of her, and he didn't want to let her find happiness. I was a bad person. But you already know that. So I kept her married out of pure stubbornness. When you told me you caught her cheating, I was furious. How dare she? 
she ruined my life, and now she wants to find happiness. I thought she didn't deserve a second of joy. She robbed me of my future and happiness. What right did she have to do this? So you killed her? I abruptly interrupted his story, returning to the point. All his excuses disgust me. He nods and finally looks me in the eyes. It seems like a weight has been lifted from his shoulders. Now his overalls don't look so heavy. Apparently he kept it to himself for a long time. Finally letting it out, he seemed to feel relieved. What about Brian? Your brother? I started dating his mom, Sandy, shortly after I married you. She wasn't the only one. I admit, I have never been faithful. I was young, good-looking, and had a bad attitude towards women. Besides, I was angry. That's why I always chose those who were easy prey. I have never despised anyone more in my life than at that moment. He is an insignificant person who can only think about himself. For him, everyone was an enemy. Nothing was his fault. It's funny, I don't hate him anymore. Listening to him, I realize that he is not the monster of my nightmares. He is just a pathetic person who could not cope with life's difficulties and took out his anger on a weaker person. I even feel sorry for him. He doesn't deserve any more hate. Time's up, the guard shouts. Everyone gets up at the same time. I hear dissatisfied grumbling around. Most complain that there is too little time. It's the opposite for me. This day was enough for me to face my demon and defeat it. Now I want to get out of here as soon as possible. It was good to see you, baby Naomi, he says, trying to hug me. I allow him this, although his touch makes me sick. This is the last time I see him. Don't be a bitch. Maybe we can do it again sometime, he says, and hope lights up in his eyes. We'll see, I answered, playing along with him. The truth is that the next time I will see him will only be at his funeral, and even that is not a fact. But there is no point in finishing him off. I did what I came for. Now I need to learn to forgive him. Josh Narrator I'm sitting in front of the TV, looking at the changing images, but honestly, I can't tell what I'm seeing. My thoughts are consumed with what is happening to Naomi. God, why does she always insist on doing everything herself? like she doesn't need me. When two hours passed after she left, I began to get nervous. After four I was already going crazy. I almost took an axe to break down the door, and then, leaning out of the opening, said, Here comes Joshik. I heard the hotel door lock click five hours later. A second later my wife came in. I looked at her, trying to catch even the slightest change. Does she look happier, sadder, lightened, free? Honestly, she just looks tired, like a warrior who has just emerged from a difficult battle. Her appearance is as beautiful as ever, but emotionally she looks broken. She throws her purse on the bed and walks over to me. I hug her as she cuddles up to me. I expect her to start crying, but she doesn't. She just hugs me. Are you hungry? I ask when she finally pulls away. She nods and begins to undress to go to the shower. I order room service while she hides in the bathroom. Her shower lasts about 20 minutes. When the food arrives, I set everything out for both of us. I instinctively know that she needs to be alone in the bathroom right now. When she finally comes out, she looks refreshed. We eat in relative silence, but it is not painful. More like a comfortable silence, like two people who don't have to talk to each other. Later that night, we lay on the bed, lazily watching TV. She laid her head on my chest, and I gently stroked her hair. We haven't discussed her visit yet. I don't want to put pressure on her, and I think she'll tell me when she's ready. Thank you, Josh, she says quietly. I stop stroking her hair. For what, honey? For everything. For always loving me. For being the person you are. For putting up with me. You have always respected me, and I feel so loved. I know I don't always tell you that I love you, but I do very much. I get scared when I realize this. Being dependent on someone is scary for me. But my life has become better thanks to you. I need you in my life. You are the best person I know. I want you to know that you are all I need, and I will always love you. She sits down and looks me in the face. Always. When we returned from prison, life continued. 
I wish I could say that we immediately went back to who we were before a loving couple, but that didn't happen, at least not right away. Naomi is working to overcome her demon, but I have a completely different problem. For me, it's trust. No matter how you look at it, Naomi lied to me throughout our entire marriage. Of course, she also lied to herself, suppressing her memories and thinking of her parents as dead, but deep down she knew it was a lie. Her cheating with her boss isn't that big of a deal for me. Perhaps the game softened the blow, don't know, but I survived her infidelity. Lying, however, is very important to me. We've had countless conversations about this. Frank conversations. One thing we learned from Beth was to listen to each other, and we do it. In the coming months, we work to restore trust. We continue to visit Beth and talk. Knowing how much we liked games, she suggested we play one of the ones they play in college. Many who have been to fraternity parties remember a game called Never Have I Ever. The rules of the game are simple. One person says, I never, and names something unusual. Everyone else who did this should take a sip of alcohol. For example, I have never participated in a threesome. Any other person involved in the threesome must drink. Sounds stupid, right? But we needed a little silliness. This really helped us. Gradually, we are returning from that abyss. We say things to each other that we never thought to mention before. I'm learning more about her than I knew during our game. I discover new sides to my wife that make me fall in love with her even more. Her sexuality is only one part of who she is. The real Naomi, the one under her breasts, is much more beautiful. I always knew this, of course, but the whole experience was so intense and cathartic that I began to see depth and dimensions to her that I hadn't fully understood before. If possible, I will fall in love with my wife again. Sounds weird? Of course, we are doing more serious things to restore trust. We started diaries. Whenever we remember something from the past, we write it down in a diary. From time to time, we read to each other from our notes. Sometimes we just take each other's diary and see if anything new has been added. Full transparency is the key to restoring trust. January 2016. As soon as I enter the house, Naomi rushes into my arms and showers me with kisses. Guess what? she asks, continuing to kiss my face. I try to reciprocate her feelings and take off my coat at the same time. On, I can't. Guess while you kiss me all over my face. She laughs and helps me take off my coat. Her face literally glows with joy. Okay, nah, what makes you so happy? So, there's a new manager in the room. She started out as a part-time trainer, but her work led to her being promoted to manager. Oh God, Naomi, this is amazing. What happened to this bastard? Her eyes sparkle with excitement. That spark returned in her gaze. She had already been there for a while. The same spark that was most visible in her when we played our game. That special trait that makes her alive. That je ne sais quoi that makes her. Naomi. Although we haven't played the game since last September. Well, she continues, apparently one loyal customer complained about watching Mark. He said that this disgusted him and made him think about changing the hall. He stated that Mark was a sexist asshole and that he was a nuisance. Several women supported him. As a result, Mark was fired and they offered me to take his place. She could tell me that we won the lottery, but this is much happier news. I hug her and congratulate her. So who is this customer who complained, I ask, curious. She smiles slyly and begins to sway from side to side. I can't say his name, Josh. It's confidential, you know. But I can tell you his name starts with a D and rhymes with Jerry. You guys know what a great guy Jerry is, right? Her face darkens when she mentions Jerry, and she looks worried for a moment. By the way, Jerry, call your sister. I'm perplexed as I pick up the phone. Why should I call Trina? Just do it, Josh, she says with dead seriousness, a stark contrast to her joyful mood when I first walked into the house. Without further questions, I dial the number. The phone goes straight to voicemail. She doesn't answer, nah. It looks like the phone is turned off. What's happening? 
Naomi glances quickly around the room as if she's deciding something important, then grabs Henry and starts putting his coat on. Come on, Josh. We'll go in your car. What? What's going on, Nah? Where are we going? She stops, clearly annoyed. We'll take Henry to your parents, and then we'll go to Trina's. At this moment, I begin to realize the seriousness of the situation. If Trina's phone isn't answering and Naomi's voice sounds so worried, it can't be a good sign. What's going on, Naomi? Tell me. She seems to sense my anxiety because she slows down. I've been trying to call Trina all day since Jerry told me the news, but she's not answering. What's the news, Nah? What did Jerry tell you about my sister? This is not about your sister. Well, not really. Jerry was offered a job in California. It looks like he's going to accept it, and I don't think Trina took it very well. Walking into my sister's house was like traveling back in time. Dirty dishes. Overflowing trash can. All this reminded me of the time after Carlos's death, and I could hardly hold back the flood of memories. Trina? Naomi called carefully. Having heard no answer, we moved on. We left Henry with my parents. When we asked my mom if she had spoken to Trina, she said she had been trying to call her for days, but it went to voicemail every time. That's when real anxiety hit me. We go upstairs and find Trina wrapped in a blanket, lying on the bed. Trina, I say carefully, turning to the figure under the thick blanket. Go away, she replies briefly, emphasizing each word. Her voice sounds flat, as if there is no life in it anymore. Naomi slowly moves closer. Trina, Josh and I came to check on you. We've all been trying to call you for days, but your phone is off. I'm fine. Now leave, the voice answers again, but it sounds completely unconvincing. Trina. I start, but she cuts me off. Get the hell out. She screams so loudly that at first it seemed to me as if she was going to jump out of bed and attack us. Her angry eyes glare at us, warning us to stay away. But I see something more behind this. I see her vulnerability. Her face is in tears, her eyes are swollen, her nose is running. She looks completely broken. Naomi flinches from the sudden outburst of anger and takes a step back, but I stand still. No, Trina, I won't leave. Damn it, Josh. You are no different from everyone else. You all leave eventually. My biological parents, Carlos, Jerry, you all leave me sooner or later. Just leave me alone. When she says this, I see her spirit breaking. Finally, like the walls of Jericho, her defenses crumble and her body begins to shake with sobs. At the risk of being pushed away, I cross the room and hug her. Trina cries into my chest. When Naomi realizes everything is okay, she comes closer too. We just hug her while she pours out all her emotions. Trina, you need to talk to Jerry, I say when her sobs have subsided a little. She pushes me away. To hell with him. Let him go to California. If that's what he wants, then screw him. Naomi shakes her head. He doesn't want to go to California, Trina. He wants to be with you. That's what he said. But he wants you to want him too. He doesn't want to live in Carlo's shadow. Trina looks at Naomi in disbelief. I will continue. Sister, you don't want Jerry to move into Carlos's house, but at the same time, you don't want to move in with him. You never introduce him as your boyfriend. How do you think he feels about this? She sobs quietly, but at least she doesn't deny it. This is already a good sign. Naomi joins in the conversation. He has been in love with you for a long time. He told me about this when we were studying in the gym. Many times. He adores Callie and little Carlos. But every time you push him away, it hurts him. So what should I do, guys? Eh? What does he want from me? Trina finally asks, finding her voice. Naomi wipes Trina's tears with her sleeve and looks at her with a smile. Someone recently told me that in order to move on, you need to face the demons of your past. I had to forgive my father for what he did to my life. I think you need to do the same, she says. Trina nods quietly. I look at my wife in surprise. She continues to amaze me. Even after all these years, there is something about her that amazes me. 
You need to forgive Carlos for leaving. You need to forgive your biological parents for abandoning you. Trust me, I know what it's like to have lousy parents. Trina looks at Naomi, a little confused. My father killed my mother. I grew up with relatives who didn't really want to take care of me. That's why you and I are so close, Trina. You and I are similar. I wish I had people like your parents who would take me in. You're lucky. Trina looks at Naomi with new warmth and hugs her. I smile looking at their connection, which began a long time ago. Now I understand why they became so close. They were akin to souls. You need to find this huge hunk who is head over heels in love with you and make him yours. I saw how the women in the audience looked at him. He won't be single for long, Trina. Trina laughs quietly, wiping her nose. I can't just stop loving Carlos, Naomi. He was my life. I can't forget him. Now it's my turn to speak. Trina, do you think Carlos would want you to be like this? He lived for your happiness. You're invalidating his memory by using him as an excuse. You use it as an excuse not to let another person into your life. Look at yourself in the mirror. Do you think Carlos would be proud of you now? These words reach their goal. I see her tense up. Trina, you and my wife are two of the strongest women I know. When I was in your basement, you told me to take my life back. So, get yourself together and return yours. You have everything to be happy. You have two wonderful children. You have a good job. And you have a man who loves you despite all your crap. You kept him at a distance for a long time, and he waited patiently. I honestly think Carlos would approve. Trina smiles hearing this. Yes, Carlos would approve. I take her phone from the bedside table and hand it to her. Call him. She takes the phone and starts looking for his number. February 2016. Hello, Beth. This is Josh. Hi, Josh. How are you? I haven't seen you for a long time. I'm already starting to worry. Yes, I received your message. That's why I'm calling back. Great. Great. So, can I expect to see you this Thursday? Actually, doctor, that's another reason I'm calling. Naomi and I are fine now. I'm grateful for all your help, but I think we're in a good place and don't need any more sessions. She fell silent for a moment. That's great, Josh. I'm so happy for you both. But it's okay, I'll ask you to come once. Only you. Naomi doesn't have to. I think she found the strength to cope with her problems. But because we were focusing on her questions, we didn't have a chance to discuss yours. My problems? Doctor, I'm fine. I don't have a problem, I say sincerely. Men, as you know, are not particularly prone to self-examination. Would you do me a favor if you came for another session, Josh? If I'm wrong, the worst that can happen is that you lose an hour of your life. I grin. Don't forget the several hundred dollars this will cost me, doctor. Beth laughs at her adorable laugh. It's true, it's true, but you have great insurance. You pay for it every month whether you use it or not, so this is your chance to take advantage of it. Plus, I saw a new Prada handbag that I really want, so both you and I can get something nice out of it. Beth knows how to persuade. I almost feel sorry for her husband. Fine. I'll come on Thursday and you can tell me all the good things about me. Thank you, Josh. When I buy that bag, I will remember this conversation. We both laugh as we say goodbye. Here he is, Beth exclaims, clearly happy to see me, as if I'm exactly the person she's been waiting for. I hug her for a moment and sit down on the couch where Naomi and I spent every Thursday during our intensive sessions. So, Josh, how are you? Fine. Naomi and I are completely fine. We haven't played the game again since the whole Mark thing happened. And by the way, Naomi was promoted after he was fired. I smile remembering this. How are things with her father? Has anything changed on that front? No, I'm afraid not. She is working on forgiving him. For the most part, she has forgiven him, but sometimes she returns to her old thoughts. I don't think she wants him to be a part of her life again. I think that ship has already sailed. Beth nods. 
Yes, you are right. Forgiveness does not mean justifying or allowing. It's just a way to free yourself from the pain that was caused to you. When you stop holding a person responsible for your suffering, you let go of both that pain and its impact on your life. She needed it. I agree with her. How are you? How are you doing, Josh? I'm fine. Dr. Kai's Naomi and I are on the same page. What else do I need? Beth nods again and smiles. But it was a slightly different smile than before, as if I had just confirmed something she already knew. Let me ask you a question, Josh. When you and Naomi played the game, what did you get out of it? I thought for a second. It was fun. She turned Naomi on, and we had great sex. What did you get from this? See, I know what Naomi got. She felt attractive. I felt power. She had control over men, including you, and they were willing to do anything for her attention. But what did you get, besides the fact that Naomi was turned on? I don't know, Beth, I answered honestly. Beth gives me an encouraging smile. Let me tell you what I think, Josh. I think you felt strong through Naomi. I think you felt special because a woman who had power over others chose to be with you. Every time she mercilessly teased some poor man, you felt like you were in control of the situation because she could have been with anyone, but she chose you. I hope Beth actually buys that Prada handbag. She's worth every damn penny we spend on her. Wow, Beth. That's exactly how I felt. Then I'll ask you one more question. How do you feel apart from Naomi? Every time I ask you something, you talk about how things are going between you two. But I rarely hear you talk about yourself separately from her. But doctor, she is my wife. We are one. Yes and no, Josh. You see, when two people become one, they don't stop being who they are. They simply join forces to create a better union. They complement each other's strengths and try to compensate for each other's weaknesses. But they never stop being themselves. Naomi always did what she thought was right. She may have asked for your opinion, but she never stopped being Naomi. You allowed her to push you into things you didn't want in the first place. When she allowed the Masur to satisfy her while she caressed him, she did not ask your opinion. She did it because she wanted to. You accepted the new boundary almost without hesitation. Then she talked you into having a threesome with this guy, even though you didn't like him. Even when you first started dating, she left herself freedom, although you only wanted to be with her on exclusive terms. Basically, you had the opportunity to build a relationship with another woman, but you chose Naomi. You always seemed to do what she wanted, despite your own desires. Oh, you have learned to accept new rules and even enjoy them. You even convinced yourself that this was what you wanted. But it all started without your participation. Well, Naomi has always been like this, from the very beginning. Yeah, but were you always like this, Josh? When you first met, were you the kind of person who liked it when his woman had sex with others? I think about her words, and it becomes clear to me that I was not like that. I remember breaking things off with her when I found out I wasn't the only one. She finally convinced me to accept it. Even my relationship with Mel was a result of her rejecting me. In the end, I returned to her again. So what do you suggest, doctor, so that I can divorce Naomi? She waves her hand as if dismissing the very idea. No, 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 Josh. I would never advise a couple to get a divorce, especially when it's a couple who loves each other the way you love each other. No, I'm sure you and Naomi should be together, but I'm saying you need to think about yourself. See, Naomi is just Naomi, and you are Naomi and Josh. You were most satisfied in this relationship when your wife was by your side and paying attention to you. Josh, you told me that the excitement of the game felt like an addiction. This is a good comparison. People get pleasure from addiction. But you can't live on this forever. A marriage that depends on the thrill of gaming is like an addiction. This feeling is great until it starts to destroy you. Soon you begin to depend on this excitement, and it seems to you that you cannot survive without it. When everything returned to its previous level, you began to get nervous. You needed Naomi to get that rush of excitement again because it made you feel better. But no marriage can withstand constant heat. These marriages burn out over time. 
No matter what rules you set, you always run the risk of getting burned if you don't learn to embrace all that marriage has to offer. Sometimes you just have to settle for comfort. Of course, you can add spice, but it should complement your connection, not justify it. These poignant moments should be like a glass of wine with dinner, not an addiction that you can't get through the day without. She tilts her head to the side and looks at me as I process her words. I feel like Luke Skywalker in the swamp with Yoda. Marriage needs balance, young Skywalker, so I got a sense of power from the game because I lived through Naomi. I ask, although I'm mostly talking to myself. Yes, Josh. You got from the game a feeling of confirmation of your importance. You see, the way I understand it, you've always expected others to do things for you. Your sister took care of you when you were little. Naomi always took care of you. She made sure you ate, she supported you. Whatever you needed, she did for you. You have often said that you feel safe with her. I don't see how this explains the game, Doctor. Why did I let her get this far? Beth smiles at me. Tell me yourself why. I never felt worthy of her. I always thought she was taller than me. When she chose me, it only confirmed that I was better than other guys. It's a nice feeling to see men want what you have, and she always comes back to me in the end. Even when I hear my own words, I find it hard to believe. But it's true. I know this is true. Josh, would it surprise you if I told you that Naomi said the same thing about you? She always felt like she didn't deserve you. You always put her first. You stayed with her despite everything she put you through. You choose her, despite the fact that you had a girlfriend who was devoted to you. You felt special because she chose you, but that's really how she felt all these years. It's like a light turns on in my head. I'm starting to see things differently. My entire marriage. We both thought we didn't deserve each other. Essentially, we were what the other needed. Can I give you some advice, Josh? I think you need to develop who you are beyond Naomi. There's a difference between marriage because you love the person and marriage because you need that person. Josh, who is married to Naomi, will be happier and better off if he knows who he is. I have a lot to think about. Beth and I talk for a while longer until my last session with her comes to an end. We hug and I thank her for everything she has done for my marriage. Beth is a true angel. I will miss her. Naomi Narrator September 2016, one year after the story with Mark. Hi, Mom. It's me, Naomi. I know I've never been here to see you before. It was just very difficult for me. You know? Anyway, I grew a lot last year. I even went so far as to write my dad a letter and tell him that I forgive him. It was quite difficult. I think I wrote ten different versions until I found the one that fit. But now I came here to tell you that I forgive you too. I forgive you for being too weak to stand up to Dad. I forgive you for not being strong enough to leave him and be with Uncle Rick, whom you truly loved. I was always afraid to be like you. I fought tooth and nail with Josh for my independence. I was afraid that if I let it go, he would own me like your father owned you. But you know what? Josh is not the father. He loves me. He really loves me. He decided to be alone with me. He treats me with respect and kindness. He is the best person I know, and I wouldn't trade him for anything. I'd like you to meet him. I wish you could see what true love looks like. I wish you were here to see your grandson. You left your future behind because you were too weak to be yourself. But I forgive you. I forgive myself, too. For a long time, I blamed myself for your death. But it wasn't my fault. It was Daddy's, and maybe a little bit yours, you two created the hell that was your marriage. But I forgive you. With these words, I kiss my fingers and touch her tombstone. I feel a warm hand touch my shoulder. I turn around to look my wonderful husband in the eyes. The only man I could count on to be there for me. He is my hero. We'll be late for the wedding, naw. I don't think Trina will appreciate the maid of honor's fashionable tardiness. I grab his hand as we walk across the street to the church. Josh. I sit and watch in awe as my wife does a group dance with the bride and a bunch of other drunken idiots. I check that my iPhone is set to record. If any of them forget what idiots they made of themselves tonight, I'll direct them to the YouTube link. 
My wife and I haven't played this game since the revelation last year. You know what? We don't need this. I fell in love with Naomi even more than on our wedding day. Her sexuality is a result of who she is. Her strength, her character, the way she loves me and pushes me to be a better person, the way she lights up when Henry walks into the room, the way she and my sisters support each other, all this makes her sexy. What we do in the bedroom is just a physical expression of deeper feelings. I love my wife. We fought our demons side by side, together, as befits a man and wife. She's mine. There always will be, to have and to hold. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. 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 Click to the next one.